Good afternoon, and welcome to GameFest 2021. I'm Ben Cheng, Director of the Games and Simulation Arts and Sciences Program at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this all online virtual version of GameFest. GameFest is a showcase of student projects and games recognizing the creativity and ingenuity in the next generation of game designers. Although we may be all remote right now, this event is a time to come together and celebrate the incredible work that these students have done over the past year. It has been, let's be honest, an extraordinary year in all senses of the word, full of challenges, turmoil, grief and loss, but also resilience and hope. During these past 12 months that have felt both like a decade has passed and kind of like no time has passed at all, games have really come forward as a source of joy and also a way to connect. Simple acts like inviting our friends over in Animal Crossing when we couldn't do that in real life <laughs> have meant so much. And so has ejecting those same friends out into space in games like Among Us. The resurgence of popularity in tabletop games has continued through virtual online tabletop games. And creative sandbox games, virtual reality experiences, meditative puzzle solving games, epic narrative games, and many others have found an important place in so many people's lives. This has also been a really exciting year for the games cluster here in the capital region of New York State, uh, with the success of titles like Mario Kart Home Circuit by Valen Studios, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 from Vicarious Visions, and more. Here at Rensselaer, we launched the MS and PhD in Critical Game Design, our next steps in the evolution of games education. These graduate programs combine theory and practice, the hands-on work of game making with the critical analysis and discourse of game studies to push the boundaries of the medium. Now, making games is always hard work. The students we'll be talking to today have had the additional challenges of remote collaboration, including across continents and time zones, and have made extraordinary work under extraordinary circumstances. For all of you who have spent this last year juggling class assignments and work and family and Zoom calls and many Discord channels, battling with version control, fixing bugs and 3D model import problems, screen sharing across the globe to solve these problems together, this day is for you. We have a terrific program lined up for you today. First, we'll be talking to some of the students whose games are featured in GameFest, doing some playthroughs and chatting about the games. And these demo sessions will run until 4 p.m. Um, at 4, we'll have our keynote speaker, Blake Sloan, a senior imaging engineer at Marvel Studios. The magic of computer graphics in games and in film have a lot in common. And Blake will be talking about the incredible work that he does and his perspective on the field throughout his career. Then at 5, We'll wrap up with the award ceremony with our competition judges from Vicarious Blip Visions at Blizzard Entertainment. This year's award categories are excellence in narrative, excellence in audio, excellence in visual art, technical excellence, and the Impact Award, as well as the Grand Prize and Audience Choice Awards. You can watch all of this today here on the stream on YouTube. And additionally, since this is an exhibition of games, what better way to experience it than in an interactive virtual game space. Uh, Richard, can we pull up that video? So this is the virtual version of the uh, GameFest exhibition that we've built in the uh, online platform Sansar, which is a virtual world for PC and VR. So you can walk around in the space, check out the booths for the different games, um, and get links to play them yourself and download them. Um, there are also posters presenting graduate student research in games. Uh, this is a multiplayer world, so bring your friends. Uh, and you'll be able to meet uh, some of the students who have made these games and talk with them about their work uh, here in Sansar. Uh, this YouTube stream that you're watching right now is also in Sansar, uh, so you can experience the entire show there. Uh, Sansar supports desktop mode on PC and a full VR experience in the Oculus Rift um, and HTC Vive. Uh, so you can be completely immersed in GameFest um, on, uh, on one of those devices. Uh, the link to Sansar is down in the description underneath the YouTube, uh, uh, this YouTube video, um, as well as the full schedule uh, of events for the afternoon. Um, and a link at the bottom to uh, our main GameFest website. But now I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. First, Vicarious Visions at Blizzard Entertainment, 
uh, who are also our judges this year in the games competition. The NYSTAR Division of Empire State Development for their support of the RPI Center of Excellence in Digital Game Development. The School of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And finally, our media partner, Agora Media, who behind the scenes are making all of this happen. So now let's go ahead and get the show started with our first student game demo. Uh, so this game is called Dear Diary and Mira Pianta is here uh, to play the game and talk about it with us. So welcome, Mira. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Dear Diary is a 2D top-down puzzle-solving RPG. It tells the student of a college student. It tells the story of a college student named Kai, as shown in the title screen. Um, he well, let's just let's start the game and we'll see what happens to Kai. <laughs> So Kai wakes up to see that his old diary that he used to write in when he was younger has mysteriously showed up on the floor in his dorm room. And someone else has been rewriting in his entries from the time when he used to write in his diary. Oh, that's really unnerving. <laughs> so this uh, mysterious writer seems to be provoking him by reminding him of this mysterious past and it, um, trying to get him to relive that past in a way. So now Kai can go out and meet his friend Nova for the day and figure out where to go from here. Nova seems to know something about this situation.
to now, Nova will follow Kai around campus and we can explore. Meet some of the students around the campus. Maybe go to the dining hall. <laughs> Now we find our friends Nico and Simon waiting for us in the dining hall since Kai hasn't eaten breakfast yet and it's almost 2 p.m. <laughs> It's like you have a you have like a whole cast of characters in here. How, how many yes. characters do you have? Um, there are four uh, main characters, including Kai. So um, Kai and his Kai and his three friends: Nova, Simon, and Nico. Um, Simon is the one on the left, and Nico on the right. Nova's following him around. Um. Simon is actually uh, one of Kai's friends from high school who ended up going to the same uh, same college together. <laughs> the other two he met while he was here. Aside from the four main characters, I believe there are seven NPCs around the campus who can, you can interact with them along the story and they have their own little tidbits to say each day. Yeah, the art style uh, is really, uh, it, it came together really well, you know, that you have this combination of the pixel art, you know, it's the classic RPG pixel art style, and then the illustrative style for the, you know, for the character portraits. Um, that's not an easy thing to make those actually really um, mesh together that, um, that tightly and keep that kind of distinctive character design um, in the, you know, in the pixel sprites that you have in that, um, you know, in the full portraits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a few different, um, we had a few different ideas for the pixel art style that we went through before coming along to this one. And the um, dialogue sprites, we had um, kind of uh, been inspired by like the Danganronpa style mm -hmm. dialogue sprites where they each have, they're kind of sketchy in a way, but also um, like very finished looking and um, with each their own kinds of expressions and characters shown. Yeah, they really, they have a lot of personality. <laughs> So since, um, since the diary entry seemed to be referring to the, um, the field that we passed earlier, we should probably go back there and see what's going on over there.
So now we enter the puzzle section of the game. So Nova, um, since she seemed to know a lot about this um, entry situation going on, it, she um, is able to show Kai how to traverse this interesting world um, while he is dealing with the uh, confusion of being in a familiar yet unfamiliar place once again from his memories. So this is a really interesting thing. This sort of mapping of the of the memories, and it sounds like um, like the kind these kind of emotional minefields of past trauma, like map mapping them onto actual physical spaces, and then making them manipulatable in some way to have to physically re uh, like retraverse that retraverse mm -hmm. that memory that that part of, the, uh, of his past. Yeah, so if you pick up these pages, you can actually read them in his diary and get more of an idea of what exactly these memories have to do with in his uh, story, or in his past. Oh, so. fantastic. So we have just a, just a minute left. Um, before we wrap up, I, I see a number of people want to know where they can play this game, and I do too. Um, <laughs> I think it's it's linked in our uh, from your booth in Sansar. Um, but if there's a link that we can uh, that we can drop into the chat, uh, yeah, I can drop go. that into the chat when I am off of this. <laughs> yeah. That would be awesome. So. Uh, since Nova knows how to get around, she can uh, get us through this puzzle pretty easily. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Well, Mira, we should wrap up um, uh, right now. Um, and I don't want to leave any spoilers, so I know there's multiple endings for this game as well, right? Yes. And, like a lot of stuff in there that, that people should just play themselves to see how it, um, uh, to see how it unfolds. Yeah. Well, terrific work. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, this, yeah, this looks awesome. Um, okay, so our next game that we're going to check out is called Savior of Dreams uh, with P uh, Chris Puglias. Chris, how are you doing? Hi, I'm doing good. Now, I've been hearing a lot about this game, a lot of buzz. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really excited to check it out and, and talk about it with you. So what is, yeah, what is Savior of Dreams? So <laughs> we like to flaunt the title that it's the first DDRPG. Uh, meaning behind that is it's a rhythm game with like a bunch of RPG elements, but its intended controller is a DDR pad. So you're supposed to play it, you know, dancing all around. Uh, sadly, I don't have my pad with me today, so I can't give you a visual demonstration. We were really hoping for that. I know. Well, blame it on RPI's connection. Yeah. Uh, so I will give you a little bit of background before we get started. The general story is that you play as Leah. Uh, an instrument knight who is returning to her homeland after getting a letter from her father. Uh, when she gets there, uh, the entire land is kind of like clouded in like a dense fog, and a lot of the characters 
or like the inhabitants of this area are suffering from nightmares and Leah has to go in and effectively save these people from their nightmares before they uh, if you are too like long in the nightmare you get corrupted and pet- like turned to stone petrified uh, we're actually not going to start directly from the beginning of the game we're going to skip past to a little bit in the center give you guys a little taste of a little bit of the story a little bit of the gameplay and then we'll switch into just checking out some fights. Chug it a little bit. Hopefully it's coming okay on your end. Uh, okay, so yeah, this is uh, the second area that you'll, you'll be in in our game. And you can go back and forth and look at some of the characters. Uh, just wants to talk to you. Um, I'm actually going to leave it on autoplay. Well, first I'll go through a little bit of the talking, and then we'll leave it on autoplay uh, so we can answer any questions you might have. That's really good. Checking along. Okay. So are all the characters animals? Yes. Uh, this is Rift. Uh, in the story right now, you you like, just uh, saved him. Like he woke him up from the nightmare, and he came and joined you. He's clearly a cool, tough guy. I can tell from the jacket. He's afraid of everything. doesn't like this very much. Uh, that's fine. We'll get on and just move on to the actual main story bit. Uh, this is... <laughs> I don't know what it's like on your guys' end. Uh, no, the, the, yeah, frame rate's a little bit choppy, <laughs> uh, but I can imagine there's some really exciting... <laughs> Dialogue, <laughs> story exposition happening. Uh, yeah. Uh, right now. So I'll, I'll give a little bit more information on some of the previous stuff. Uh, I don't want to give too much away. <laughs> this is like the middle of the game. So let, let's yeah. just jump into the fights. Where this upcoming fight um, is against. Uh, this little lamb character's uh, fiance, and you have to go save her before she gets petrified. Uh, there's a total of seven fights in this game, each with their own like music track and everything. Uh, two of those fights are tutorials, so they're not like full full fights, but they have unique music and charts. Oh, geez, that stream's really behind. Um, that makes me worried about the actual fight. We'll see. Yeah, his character designs are beautiful. Thank you. So we're going to jump into one of the fights right now, and I'll show that off. Uh, I'm sending my partner to Ariera, the monkey, because uh, that's my favorite. Oh, that's not synced. Okay. Uh, Let's try reloading that real quick. Um, is the stream going to catch up? Okay, here we are. A little unfortunate. You need the rhythm game to be synced. <laughs> That's still not working. Oh, okay.
Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll try one more time. Uh, this is not how I was hoping it was going. <laughs> So there's a so the different characters that are on screen there um, are are you, uh, uh, are, you are you are they all like uh, are you controlling all of them at the same time or some of them are you battling against them uh, what do they what are they doing there um, so uh, is the stream up still looks like it's uh, let's see no, oh, yeah okay, okay, right. yeah uh, I'll just leave it at the pause screen at the moment um, so you're at the very bottom you're the little rabbit uh, by all the arrows. Right above your score, where the one in the gold is and next to the health bar, that's your partner. So that's where the monkey is. Uh, center of the screen is the boss. And this boss has like uh, a puppeteering like theme to it, as in like she's not controlling her own actions, which is what like the big eyes are in the corner. And if you saw like the intro animation, uh, there's a whole like uh, the puppets like breaking and stuff. It's Pretty cool. <laughs> and the little uh, chime character that walked on screen is just a like a similar puppet like conjured up by the nightmare. Uh, okay. And like it's just kind of like an sex an, access, an accessory to the fight. Mm -hmm. So I'll try one more yeah, time. Yeah, why, why? Third, third time's <laughs> the charm. Or fourth time. And then fourth we'll jump into and just look at I guess the arts of other fights, but uh, the animations are cool. I want to see those. <laughs> This is the closest it's been. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, there it goes. And this is not sync. I'll be able to play it still, but uh, know that when you like play the game without stream lag, um, it does run really fine. The notes are synced to the music. It's just they get loaded in at uh, the improper time. Oh, <laughs> now it's lagging too much. Uh, OK. So, I'll talk a little bit about how the game works, because this is not working. Um, basically, combat is separated into two separate phases. There's the evasion phase, where the enemy is in control, and they're sending down uh, attacks in the form of mines uh, in like normal TDA. So those like were the roses that are coming down the screen. You have to avoid them. Uh, if you're playing like on pad and your foot's on the right arrow and a rose is coming down the left arrow, you're going to take damage. Uh, they, they're like the opposite of notes. You're supposed to avoid them. Uh, and then once you get through the evasion phase, if you survive long enough, it switches to the attack phase. And then it's your turn to strike back. We have an elemental attack system uh, in which the player has access to three different elements, fire, ice, and electricity. And all of the different partner characters that you can equip or like take into battle with you have their own element as well. But the partners also have secondary effects. Uh, so I have the little monkey. The monkey has a grass elemental effect and boosts your defense, so you take less damage. Uh, the other character was, that was available was Rift, the gecko, who is, uh, is a water element, and he boosts your MP meter, which you can see in the right hand corner. That's how you can like use your stronger attacks. Uh, once you beat a boss uh, by like doing enough damage in your attack phases, uh, each song has two evasion phases, two attacks, and they loop. So it, after it loops and you beat the boss, or before it loops and you beat the boss, uh, you gain a certain number of experience points based on how accurate you were, like a score. You know, Instead of just getting like an A or an S or a B, after you completed a rhythm game, that score uh, then funnels into the amount of points that you're going to get. What do the uh, what do the the roses mean? Oh, those are just uh, the mines for this particular fight. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, if you if we go into a different fight, there'd be unique mines for mm -hmm. uh, each of those. So we're going to jump into this. Like, uh, this is how you replay fights you've already beaten. Uh, it's a dream catcher. Uh, so once you're here, you can go through just the five unique fights that aren't tutorial based, and you can replay them once you've beaten them once. Uh, for the sake of this presentation, I've just set them all to be accessible. So we just saw uh, Autophobia, which is the fight we were just in, but I'll see if we can get through the intro animations at least. 
of some of the other fights. So, oops, uh, that might stutter too much. Um, but yeah, this is just uh, the, this is the first major fight that you have to go through. Uh, it's fear of imprisonment. Uh, it's a little fox trap in the giant fox tail. Uh, then there is uh, the first area boss, uh, which is against Riff's own nightmare. So you got a little lightning dragon because he's afraid of lightning. Oh, so all so they're all fears. Um, yes. Yeah. That's an, so. This is, there's really like a third layer to this. So it's yeah. <laughs> a dance rhythm game, and it's an RPG game, and then it's also a kind of a game of uh, of psychology and about about fears and phobias. Yep. Layered on uh, onto both of those. <laughs> some of them have like a well. Some of the fears are like pretty abstract. Uh, this is like the penultimate fight. Currently, it's just the fear of emptiness, like fear of the void. Uh, this is a very like, abstract nightmare. Um, story behind this is like all your partners are captured, and you have to like fight through. I wish I could show it to you because it's pretty cool, but <laughs> the stream's not gonna let me. Um, you have to basically go through the three partners you had at, at that point. They're taken away from you, and they fight like altered versions of their nightmares. Uh, so. I can talk about it. Yeah. So Rift is afraid of lightning, so he has the dragon coming back, but it's a different style. Uh, Ariera is like afraid of growing up, like time. So she has like, a clock kind of monkey that she has to fight. Um, and then Sonata, which is the bird character and the third partner, is like fear of like, inadequacy. Like she's not good enough. She can't live up to uh, the expectations that is set for her. So there's like two of them going back and forth, like a mirror image of herself, and they like loop around. Uh, that's pretty cool. And this is uh, Omniphobia, the final boss. Uh, <laughs> the final boss is the Nightmare. It's a giant horse. Uh, you can catch the intro of this. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a big dynamic fight because it's, you know, the finale. Uh, definitely can't show this one, huh? Chris, how did you get this idea to try to merge these two things together, uh, like RPG and dance rhythm games? Yeah. <laughs> um, so th this whole pitch idea was actually the culmination of uh, my pitch and Hannah's pitch, who's our musician. And we ended up having like super similar ideas, so we ended up combining them, and it worked out beautifully. Uh, I can't speak for her inspiration, uh, but my inspiration was just kind of like, there's a lot of rhythm games out there, but most of them are just like, you know, the rhythm games. You play the songs, there's like a little bit of story. Um, we wanted to make something that was a little bit more story driven, a little bit more like, interesting yeah. and like mechanic wise. Uh, and yeah. then just the name BDRPG is fun. Yeah. Uh, we have a little bit of video um, uh, of gameplay that we can put on uh, that will probably stream oh, a little bit smoother. Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah, let's just take a look at that. Okay. Figure uh, of Dreams, Christopher Pugliese, Hannah Bilger, Hoon Soup Beneni, Rebecca Braniak, James Piesco, Skip King, Brianna Geck. Ah, okay. There it goes. So if people want to play um, uh, play this more, uh, check it out. So uh, ch you can uh, check out their booth in, in Sansar and link to it there. And um, do you have uh, yeah? Do you have a, a, a preview build out there that people can try out? And do they need to have a game pad to be able, like an actual dance pad right. to be able to play? Uh, so you don't need the dance pad to play our game. Uh, of course, that's the intended way, but uh, we made it. Perfectly doable for keyboard controls. Um, and that's what I was playing on right now, actually. Um, so, like, for first-time players, we'd probably suggest to use the keyboard controls because some of the charts are uh, kind of hard, especially on pad. So uh, if you want to play our game, yes, we have an itch page. We have our game posted on itch. A um, couple things to note about that. Uh, since Perforce is down, we're a little bit uh, in between stuff right now. 
So the current build on there has like a single bug in it. So we're gonna be fixing that as soon as possible and posting a better build. Uh, in the meantime, as soon as this ends, I'm going to throw up an older version of the build. Um, better than nothing, and you guys can check that out. But also on our itch page, there's two other things I gotta point out. Uh, we have a separate build folder, a uh, build file that you can download and run uh, of just the fights. So you open that and it's just the dream catchers filled up. You can choose the fights you want to go through. So once you've actually, because we don't actually have saving implemented yet, uh, that's something we're planning on working on in the upcoming week after finals are over. Um, <laughs> but it's a work in progress anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, so, it, looks, it looks fantastic for what um, for what you've done already. Just um, really, it's just in this in this one semester so far, and I know you all are going to be continuing on uh, working with this, and I'm really excited to see how it continues to evolve. Um, thank you. All right, Chris, thank you so one much. More, one more thing we got to say about the itch page. Um, uh, our artist, Hun Suk, made two like animatics, like two minute long animations, and you can view them on our itch page. Small note about them, the audio in them is temporary. We're going to replace in that later uh, because it's not all ours. It's not all made by our musicians. But you can check them out either in the story once you play up to that point or on our itch page. All right. Okay. Chris, <laughs> That's thank all you for so me. much. <laughs> Here. Um, all right. So to uh, move on to our next uh, demo, and bring up our my one of my co-hosts, Jim Malazita. All right. Hey, Ben. It's a beautiful day on YouTube today. That's right. <laughs> Look at it. It's sunny. It's grassy. Um, let's say, yeah, it's lovely over here. Uh, oh, one thing I wanted to mention to everybody before we um, go on is that voting is open for the Audience Choice Awards. Um, so all these games that you're seeing on the stream um, today, uh, those are all um, in the show. You can check them out in uh, in Sansar, and there are additional ones as well. Um, so we're only showing uh, some of the games in the show uh, in the demo slots this afternoon, but there's a number of additional games as well, and you can see in Sansar. And we should probably try to post some of those links into the chat as well um, for those of you who can't get into the Sansar space. Um, and uh, like check out all these games, whichever one you're really excited about and you think should uh, win the Audience Choice Award, put your vote in um, before the end of the, um, uh, before the keynote starts, sorry, um, by four o'clock is when we'll um, uh, start wrapping up the, uh, the voting for that. Okay, so welcome, Jim. All right, thanks so much. Um, so thanks so much for being here, everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Malazita. I'm the Associate Director of the Games and Simulation Arts and Sciences Program here at RPI. Uh, so I'm going to be taking us through two games today. Uh, the first demo that we'll be showing uh, is In Between the Sun and the Sea uh, with presenter Owen Hay. Hey, Owen. Uh, hi there, Jim. How are you? Good. So what exactly is In Between the Sun and the Sea? So In Between the Sun and the Sea is a narrative-based puzzle game um, that me and five other students developed over the last four months in Game Development 2. Um, it follows the story of Violet, who is a young woman who, after a traumatic uh, head trauma, actually started developing colorblindness, um, a form of colorblindness called tritinopia. Um, and it follows her experience as this kind of sudden change in her life uh, happens, and you get to solve some fun puzzles along the way. Awesome. Um, so right off the bat here, I uh, hope you guys can see the screen fine. Uh, what you're looking at is just the main menu. And uh, right off the bat, you can see some of the great work that our artists did. Um, so that is Nick Paterno and Sarah Marekwa. So they did a great job uh, making a nice art style for the game that was kind of simple and fun, um, but that also, also kind of gave a sort of dreaminess uh, feel to the game because the game is mostly experienced inside of Violet's head. Uh, so right off the bat here, I'm just going to uh, start the game. In the background, you can notice some of the music that was developed for the game. That's by Justin Hung. He did a great job making different soundtracks for the different levels in the game um, that all kind of evoke a different feeling for what we were trying to get the player to feel during that game. So uh, here in the room, this is uh, Violet's room, and it also serves as the level selection screen for the game. Uh, the idea is that she is bed, like sort of in like a home nursery sort of situation. Uh, and from here, you can select the different levels for the game and, and play through the, the experience. Um, you can see that we went for a low poly art style, which worked really well with the uh, skills that our artists have and also just the size of our team. Um, and I think it really fit well with the theme of our game. 
So uh, you can see as I look around here, I have different objects that I can highlight. So I'm going to click on this book here, and that will bring me to the, one of the levels. Uh, a big part of our game is that the entire thing is voice acted. Um, so here you can hear me. <laughs> I was one of the voice actors. Um, this is the library level. Uh, one of the three main levels in the game. Here we're meeting our friend Leo. Of course. I'm not going anywhere. So um, we get this kind of nice little uh, dialogue at the beginning, and we get to meet Leo, who's our best friend here. Um, and then also just kind of get to explore the scenery. So we're in some sort of library here. Um, but remember that this is a puzzle game, so we're going to be trying to figure out some sort of thing. Uh, and we have these sort of uh, bookcases sort of thing. Um, not really exactly sure what to do. Well, I, I know what to do, but <laughs> the player might not. Uh, but as you move around, you might discover that you can pick up these books. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to go around and kind of try to figure out what to do. This kind of gives me an opportunity to talk about some of the development cycle, right? or part of the development of the game, um, was that we were developing a, a game based around color, right? Um, and so because of that, we wanted the puzzles to all be based around color because of something that will become apparent uh, as the game goes on. The idea is that uh, Violet is, um, oh, here we get a little hint. Maybe I can stack these books in the right order. So if the player is not uh, figuring out the puzzle quick enough, they can, you know, they get a little hint. So here I'm trying to match the stack of books here with the stack of books seen in the case. Um, in the background, you can hear another music track by Justin Hung. He did a great job on that. And if I finish this stack... What's the shoe? How we advance the story. Um, the next thing, so so what I want to talk about is that the game is, is about her experience as the Trinobia gets worse, which means that as the game goes on and as you complete more and more puzzles, uh, the Trinopia or the color blindness in the game is going to progressively intensify, um, which kind of means that the puzzles, since they're color based, are going to get more difficult. So let me just finish up this puzzle here so I can show you that. Um, another thing that I want to mention as I finish this puzzle is that you can see that all of the uh, books around here have different symbols on them. And this is something that we really uh, wanted to emphasize in the game because if the idea was that if you can't rely on color to solve these puzzles, you can rely on other things just like people with actual color blindness do. Um, for example, using things like symbols or words or stuff to identify things rather than colors. So here I've completed the second one, and then I will just complete the third one real quick. Let me find a teal book. I can interact here with Leo. Look at you. You don't even need my help. You're doing great without me. Oh, Leo, don't say that. The entire world has this kind of surreal, dreamlike quality. Exactly. Um, our artist did a fantastic job with this. Um, just kind of one making a cohesive uh, art style that kind of fit all together, but then also making the feeling of being in a dream world. Um, and you'll see, especially in the next level that I show, uh, that, that we definitely get that feeling. So we've completed all three of the or all three of the book stacks, and now we can head. Uh, let's just listen to what Leo has to say. So now that we've completed that level, we can head back to the bedroom and we, you'll start to see that the Trinopia of Violet has started to intensify. So the, the room looks a little bit off now, uh, one, because we have Leo sitting here. Um, he's he's a little bit like in a ethereal state and that's supposed to give the player a feeling of, or I guess they get to choose whether or not the people are actually in the room um, or whether or not it's just a figment of Violet's imagination. You'll always be my best. Um, so next, next I'm gonna head over to this level and now that we've completed one of the levels, we have some slight color blindness. Um, now it's not fully intense, so uh, it's not going to be super, super uh, limiting. But as you complete more levels in the game, it's going to get worse and worse. Or it's going to get stronger and stronger, I should say. Um, so you can see, as you mentioned, Jim, uh, 
you know, we're kind of going for this kind of dreamlike atmosphere. And this is definitely the feeling that I get when I'm in this level. Um, it definitely feels like something inside of her head. Here's Violet's mother. So what were some of the uh, decisions you and your team were making as you thought about how to design this world as though, um, uh, you know, from a very different perspective than we, we usually think about the design of visual video games, right? Where you're actually highlighting the differences between color and non-color. Yeah, exactly. So, so one thing that was really important during the development of this game was that uh, because the players can choose the order of the levels that they were in, they all needed to make sense in both a colorblind world as well as a normal world. Um, and so this level, depending on when you play it, is going to have very different uh, playthroughs. And and that was something that was kind of fun to play with, you know, kind of see how uh, a level would change over the course of the game. Mm -hmm. um, so this one, I have these levers here, um, and I'm just try, trying to get through this door, it looks like. Um, and it looks like as I am uh, putting the colors over the center thing, it is like combining the colors somehow. So if I'm trying to get this teal green, uh, or so maybe like light green thing, and maybe if I grab a green and a yellow, you can see that they match and uh, we're able to progress through the level. That's a really neat uh, application of color theory. Yeah, that was actually one of the one of the most interesting things to kind of learn about as we developed this game was there's so much fascinating information about colors and how they mix and, you know, additive versus subtractive color mixing and all that sort of stuff, which we had to think about um, as a lot of it, as the, as the puzzles and the thing are color based. Here we're trying to make a kind of bluish. So blue seems like a good place to start. Um, green, that gets it pretty close. Maybe we'll lighten it up a little bit. That looks close, but not exactly it. There we go. Uh, so if the player is playing this for the first time, they would want to listen to what the mother has to say and sort of learn about Violet's life. Um, so here the mother is seen to be a uh, kind of negative person in her life, telling her that her fascination in space isn't really worth pursuing. And look at some of the scenery. Now, some of the other people who worked on this game, who I haven't mentioned yet, are Bruno Spinelli uh, and Zambo Lin. Uh, they were two of the other programmers slash game designers who implemented the puzzles as well as just did most of the coding for the game. Uh, I was also one of the programmers slash game designers. So here we're trying to make a pink, uh, and I will probably start with a pink. That seems to be good. Maybe adding green. So. Pink and green on the on the color wheel when you're when you're combining those colors in a light based uh, system like we are in this level, uh, it basically just makes it white. So that is not what we're going to be looking for here. However, if we add this red, uh, we can see we're getting pretty close. Maybe that uh, that's close. And finally, if you get it right, um, I think if you were playing this game for the first time, you would probably struggle with the puzzles a little bit more, um, but just for the sake of demonstration. Then here we have the last uh, dialogue with the mother. So voice acting was something that we kind of struggled with throughout the whole game because we all wanted the game to be voice acted, but none of us really had experience in that. So it was a great learning experience in that way because uh, none of us had ever really done this, but we got to uh, do voice acting and kind of face the challenges that you run into when you're doing that. So that's the second level, and that's the last level that I'll be showing today. Um, but you can see that now we're in the room. The color blindness is getting quite intense now, and we now have two of the characters in the room. There's one more level that I won't get into today, but um, if you're interested, you can download the game on our itch page, uh, which I'll link in the YouTube stream uh, right after this. Great. This is wonderful, Owen. I love how tightly together the, the narrative and the aesthetic dimensions of the game really are. Everything is, is really well weaved and integrated. Yeah, something that we really tried to focus on with this game was uh, keeping the scope of it relatively small so we could 
feel like the things that we did make were very polished. Um, and so we initially had way more levels planned and way more characters and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, but we ended up cutting it so that we could really focus on you know, the exact art style that we wanted to nail and exactly the narrative that we wanted to tell um, rather than stretching too thin and having it feel incomplete. Great. So before we go, I wonder, Owen, um, what types of, of lessons or ideas do you want your players to walk away uh, with from this game? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the first, the, the, the main thing is that since the game is about colorblindness, the main thing that we want to tell the player is, is we want to tell the story of somebody who has colorblindness. We want them to be able to understand what that's like and kind of what the challenges are. And as they play through the game more um, and they experience the puzzles, they're going to start getting quite frustrated, I'm sure, uh, because, you know, they, they can't see exactly what the colors are and they can't, you know, match them up exactly. Um, but that's the feeling that we wanted to f make them feel, right? You know, we, typically when you're playing a video game, you don't want to feel frustrated, but that was actually something that we were striving towards and pressing for because that is something that people with um, color blindness, especially if it's particularly intense, uh, do feel. Um, and so, so that was definitely something. And then the other part of that is that we want to also talk about the kind of solutions to that. You know, what what sort of things can somebody with color blindness do if that's what they're struggling with? For example, using like the symbols or relying on your friends and family like Violet does in the game. Yeah, it's a great way of, of thinking through accessibility in games, not as an extra add-on, but actually something that can be a core to the game's story. Exactly. Great. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Owen, and the entire team behind In Between the Sun and the Sea. That was wonderful. Uh, so for our next demo, uh, we're going to be showing Voyage by Jin Yu Zhuang. Hey, Jim. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. Awesome. So tell us about Voyage. Um, so, you know, for the last year, um, we faced the global pandemic and people are kind of forced to go into quarantine. So that's kind of the initial um, intention for me to start this project because one day I just started wondering like, hey, why not create a virtual travel experience so people can hang out virtually? Um, so that's the primary reason um, to start this project, Voyage. Um, so Voyage is a virtual travel experience. Um, it simulates the entire Earth with Google Map geodata and presents it to player as a huge multiplayer sandbox open world. It is also a shared environment, so player gets to meet each other in this game, share their journey, and make their own creations in the world. So their creations will be in this world forever, not only seen by all the other players traveling to the place, but also lighting up the region. So this is a brief introduction of the project. Um, let's just go ahead and get into it. So here is a little map that the player can use to choose their um, location or coordinate they're going to visit. So I'll just go ahead and visit our campus because I haven't been there for a long time. <laughs> um, let's just search RPI. And I'll go ahead and grab the coordinates and paste it and start the game. So yeah, um, as you can see, we're now in campus. and the player will be able to um, walk around and interact with this world. And as you might notice, um, there are some places where um, the whole world is presented as this grayscale world. It's because um, there is not enough um, creations in this region. So the only way the player can light up this region is to place their creations. Um, so if I walk into here, I can actually see some of the creations that people put um, previously. This is actually done by myself. <laughs> and um, so there are currently three types of creations, a text sign, a tree, and a flower. So let's place a sign here. And the player will be able to edit it. Um, let me just quickly edit the sign. So, um, hey, I am on campus. Oops. Yeah. and. People will be able to see it um, once they travel to the same place. And that's pretty much um, everything about this project. And 
it started as really just an empty grayscaled world. Um, but if you walk around, you will be able to see like um, people have started to go into this world and place their stuff there. So um, let me just walk into here to see what's going on there. So the world really is like a, a persistent, almost blank slate for different types of players to be sharing uh, uh, just different creative ideas. Yeah, exactly. Um, so people will, will be able to um, place their creations at the, as they want. And the whole world is started just like an empty database. And people will be able to go in and um, modify it and interact with other people's creations hard, however they want. This is really neat. And you know, I'm sure uh, uh, a lot of folks probably have questions about some of the technology behind this. What was it like integrating Google Maps and Google Earth into uh, uh, this type of game? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so to integrate this world, um, I use the Google Map SDK. Um, it allows me to grab all the geodata I need um, from Google Map um, technology. And to um, integrate into Unity, we just grab all the um, coordinates of the buildings and the height of the building, which is stored in the Google Map database, and present it um, as kind of this white box model that will be able to like be textured um, however I want. So that's kind of the technical integration behind this project. And I will set up this online database to store um, all the player accounts information and also the creations. So if you go into here, um, Oh, um, someone just placed a <laughs> sign here that says, I live here. And also, people will be able to interact with each other's creations by press E to like, like this one. So you will be able to see like when did this person um, put the flower here. And it's actually liked by two different travelers. So, um, so there's, there's kind of like a social media element to it as well. Yeah, um, I'm really glad and thrilled to see like how much um, how many creations people have put into this world. And um, I think till today, uh, we already have more than 15, uh, 50 um, play testers and have came into this world, edited and show their important plays to other people. So let me go to the main menu and actually showcase another um, features I have, um, which is the, um, I would say real time day and night system so, you know, um, on the East Coast, we're actually in afternoon. But if we go to my hometown in China, um, it's actually at night. Um, so let me just uh, type in city, which is a great sightseeing mm. um, place in Beijing. And let me just grab the coordinates. Oops. Paste it. Boom. We are now here in Beijing. And um, let me just walk closer to some of the creations so the world will be more colorful. And as you can see, um, we have the stay and night switch, which kind of give player a feeling that they're actually in this world, feeling the time difference. Right, it's really less of like a, a completely separate world and one that's uh, almost feels like it's overlaid on top of our own, right? And really uh, deeply connected to it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this is the sign that I placed <laughs> a long time ago. It says, hey, this is Forbidden City. Um, and a couple of flowers and trees here. Oh. <laughs> and there's some, someone putting a sign here, say hi there. Um, let me just put a sign right beside him and say, hello. <laughs> So yeah, this is pretty much everything about this project. And also, um, you will be able to get this mini map that kind of show you the um, perspective of like a traditional GPS map that we're familiar with. Yeah, and you know, I'm, I'm interested in how, um, you know, not only does this project uh, just have a really interesting kind of cool persistent interface, but it also kind of shows us some of the underlying logics of, of databases in Google Maps itself, right? Uh, I saw in the comments that there's uh, like vastly different kinds of geometries for different objects, depending on how popular the building might be. Um, and so it's a really interesting exploration of both social experiences, but also what types of data are built into things like Google Maps and all these different um, 
uh, kind of pathfinding technologies. Yeah, exactly. I started this project just as um, a way to like let people go out and hang out with e each other. But it's really thrilling to see like how people are really like liking this world and going to it and stay connected in this world. So um, yeah, I'm very excited to see um, what this world will be in the future. Great. So speaking of the future, you know, what are your plans for some of the creative objects? Are you planning on uh, developing kind of more in-house that, that players can use? Are you planning on uh, allowing players to bring their own uh, objects in? Kind of what's your dream for this space? Yeah, so um, my imagination in the future is probably people will be able to customize um, their stuff into this world. So maybe I'll be able to upload my own 3D model and place it in the world to showcase um, maybe what my house looked like or um, place different... Um, just different stuff there. And another idea that I have, uh, which will be integrated in the, in the future, um, it's a lighthouse that people will be able to build together. So like when I go, to, go into a place, I'll be able to start a foundation of a building and other people will, will, will be able to help me and continue to construct this um, lighthouse or the building. So those are two ideas that I'm planning to implement in the future. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting this, um... Uh, this project really is, and for our, our viewers, uh, in some cases, very much on the cutting edge of where games are going now, right? So moving beyond thinking about games as uh, static experiences or beginning or games that have clearly a beginning and an end, but rather games as a social and collaborative creative space. Uh, games where, I mean, I could even imagine not just creating in here, but hosting events in spaces like this as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I, I was also like having a lot of fun developing this project, just seeing like um, being able to integrate some technologies that people will not traditionally put into game or gamification. Um, so it, it was really a lot of fun developing this project. Great. And it looks like, you know, the, the project uh, is already um, uh, connected to some web services. So if uh, folks want to check out and, and start populating this world, uh, where can they go to, to uh, hang out? Yeah, so if people want to go into the Sansar world, there should be a link um, to the um, main page of, this web, uh, of the project. And there will be an H.io page um, linked to the download link. So I'll also be posting my download link in the maybe the YouTube channel um, after this. So feel free to check it out. OK. Great. So uh, this was uh, Voyage. Um, thank you so much, Jingyu. This is such a really great and amazing project. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, two really, really great uh, uh, game demos here. Um, so as we bid uh, bon voyage to Voyage, uh, I'd like to introduce the next uh, presenter who will be taking us through a couple of our projects, uh, Dr. Nick Miser. Hey, Jim. Hey, Nick. How you doing? Doing great. I'm enjoying the dandelions. <laughs> yeah, it's really, uh, for those of you who aren't around, spring is slowly trying to make its way to the uh, upstate New York capital region right now. So it's nice to see a little bit of green space. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right. Well, uh, thanks, Jim. We will go ahead and get started with uh, our next game, which is the Inn at the End of the World. And we're going to bring Annabelle Prodnik on to show us some uh, demo footage from that game. Hey, Annabelle. Hi, Dr. Miser. Okay. So what can you tell us about the game? All right. So the Inn at the End of the World is a post-apocalyptic hospitality simulator. It's not exactly a shooting zombies kind of post-apocalypse. Um, so the idea behind it is that you're following characters, you're following people um, in this post-apocalyptic setting where the focus is really on atmosphere. Because well, at the very beginning of the game, we didn't really realize it, but the setting of the game is very much inspired by the past year or two where people have been very isolated from each other. And so we really wanted to hone in on that isolation and create stories that um, would allow players to be closer to other people, even if they were 2D sprites. A 
Okay, so right now we are going over um, the sort of introduction of the story. Um, we, we do encourage uh, those of you watching to play the game yourself to get most of the story. Um, there's lots of replayability involved in that the people that you meet won't be same, won't be the same every time. So uh, we're not going to dive too deeply into the massive dialogue trees we have, um, because we do encourage players to experience it for themselves. Yeah, it seems like a, when I, I played through this last night, actually, and you can tell that there a lot of world building went into the back end of this and that you're just getting the tip of the iceberg when you play. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Our writers worked very hard to make a very uh, expansive world that kind of emphasizes this idea that there's so much out there that you're just not quite able to reach. You're just a little bit away from, and your only way to uh, connect with these societies so far away is to connect with the people who come to see you. Right, and that's true even in this this day cycle here, you're out gathering supplies right now, yes? Yeah, yeah. So the main way that you can sort of care for these people is not only by talking to them, but also by feeding them. You know, food brings people together. So we want the player to spend most of their day out gathering supplies so that they can provide for their guests as best as possible. Um, and the, the way that you use these supplies is through our cooking system, which you'll be seeing soon. But um, So people will have different preferences and you can sort of cater to those preferences through uh, the food that you decide to cook. Now, uh, tell me uh, the the characters and which order they appear and how many appear. That didn't that seem. I got the sense that wasn't set in on each playthrough. Is that right? Yeah. So different characters have different uh, reputation requirements. So your the goal of the game is to build up your inn's reputation so that it can become a sort of hub for the people of the post apocalypse. And different characters will appear at different. Um, reputation levels. So on day one, before you've gathered much of a reputation, you're going to be seeing characters such as Fawn and Arachne here, um, who are maybe less influential in the post-apocalypse. Whereas later on, we're not going to see them in this demo. You might encounter someone like Zion, who has a bit more power. And this is where those dialogue trees really come in. There's a lot of depth of Oh, yeah. dialogue that you've built out in these. Now, uh, and the, the character design here is obviously really distinctive too. What can you tell us about your the, the team's thoughts in, in putting these characters together? Yeah, so uh, as far as the characters' concepts go, um, we wanted to, or well, rather the general look of them, we wanted to create something that was kind of adjacent to what would be familiar to people. So like their clothes are fairly familiar, but pretty simplified and a bit fanciful. Um, and the people themselves who wanted to keep simple, appealing and distinct. Um, so someone like Fawn, she's very soft, huggable. Um, and she has these big old eyes and a little blushy. <laughs> um, <laughs> But we wanted to create a sort of distinct look to the characters yeah. um, so that they're not quite human, but they're very recognizable. Yeah, and you, you kind of settle into it. After the first couple of days and you get a couple of the varieties, it, it, it feels homely uh, uh, as the inn kind of comes to life and you get to know. And the characters will come back, right? Yeah, so we have... Um, unique characters, and we have um, one-off characters. So the unique characters, such as Fawn and Arachne, have full-on unique sprites. Um, and they're the ones that, if you do well with them, if you care for them well, then they'll decide to come back and you can delve further into their uh, story arcs. 
whereas other characters will be more one shot, just goofy little characters that uh, you meet and get um, rewards from that you can increase your inn's reputation from. And here's the cooking system, yeah? Yeah, so obviously this is day one. It's a pretty simplified um, version of the cooking system in that you haven't really collected much yet and all that. But you pretty much um, here, you have to choose which person you're going to feed, right? Because you don't necessarily have the yeah. right things for everybody at all times. Oh, here, no, you had the, on this day, they actually got enough. My first night, I did not have enough to feed everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so in order to uh, make sure that the player, if they've been doing their job, um, has, <laughs> has stuff to feed people, we also have packaged foods, which um, yeah. maybe don't taste is nice, but they're there and they can be fed to people. So the different foods do have different qualities to them. Um, and by that, I mean they have different attributes and different characters will enjoy or dislike different attributes of food. And we obviously went pretty quickly through the dialogue, so you probably couldn't tell. But um, when you talk to the characters, you can sort of get a sense as to what they may prefer. So then the, in the morning is when you come down and you have to say farewell to each person, yeah? Yeah, and the morning is when you can get a, get a sense of your impact on them. Oh, I love the fawn hug. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Annabelle. And this, this is linked in the Sansaria. You've got a playable buildup, yeah? Yeah, and I can also drop our itch page link in the YouTube chat. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right. Now, next up, we're going to have Millie Harris. And Millie's going to be showing us her game, Violet Dawn. Hey, Millie. Hi, Dr. Miser. How are you? Good. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well. So I guess I will just jump right into this and tell you what Violet Dawn is. So Violet Dawn is a third person perspective magical fantasy exploration game where you play as a young fox leaving your den for the first time. And once you enter the world, you kind of realize that you're alone and there's no one around you. And so the whole purpose of the game is to explore the environment and kind of uncover the truth about why you're alone and why everyone has left. So now we'll just jump right into it. Um, so as you can see, everything around us when we spawn in is very purple. And the reason being for that is because I feel like purple is a color that really embodies magic and fantasy. And I think that that's something that I really wanted to be reflected in this world. Um, and so as you can see here, there are these paw print tracks. So throughout the game, we're just going to be following the path here to kind of see where that leads us. Um, so this game, uh, it definitely has more of a focus and emphasis on the environment and the art and less of a focus on your typical gameplay mechanics or anything like that. It's mostly uh, meant for the player to just be able to enjoy the experience of exploring the world. And it has a really big emphasis on just that explanation, exploration factor of gameplay. Yeah, I want to be in there and just surrounded by all those lights. It really does feel great. And then the, the, the bounding of the fox. I love that leap. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I definitely wanted the nature of the fox to be very youthful and playful um, to kind of show their innocence. And they don't really realize maybe um, how much the world has to offer and what kind of things are happening in this world that they haven't uncovered yet. Um, yeah, and another thing that I wanted um, to get across with this game is kind of a calm and serene feeling for the player, which is also emphasized with the music. Um, as you can hear, it's soft and serene, just a nice background piano track that doesn't really uh, distract from the overall experience, but kind of just adds a nice background ambiance to it. And the fox can also swim around in this lake here. Mm -hmm. 
So this game um, I created in the class Experimental Game Design with the professor Kathleen Ruiz. And uh, it was a really, really unique experience working on this game because I was uh, a solo person for the project. So um, my main concentration as a game developer is as an artist, which is obviously why this game has such a large focus on the environment and the character model and animations. Um, but it was also really cool to be able to work as a programmer and as a composer as well for this game project. Um, it was great to be able to see how the other roles uh, do their job and how, everything that just goes into making a game aside from just the art part of things. Yeah, trying on all the hats. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Um, another inspiration for this game that I wanted to bring up is um, I've just always like really, really loved animals. I think that they're such amazing creatures and oftentimes as humans, we kind of uh, overlook the effect that we can have on wildlife and the natural environment. So um, something that this game definitely delves into is uh, the effect that us as humans can have um, on natural wildlife, which is something that is revealed in the ending of the game that I don't quite want to uh, reveal in this playthrough. But if you do play the game and you follow this path here that I'm taking right now, uh, you will get to see how the game ends and find out why you're alone in the world. Mm. Yeah, and you do find, I, I, I did not uh, get to the end last night when I played, but you, you find yourself kind of it invites that kind of curiosity that you're talking about. You're wondering, are, they, are these bear prints here? Like It looks like bear to me, but uh, it's been a while since I've been tracking. <laughs> yeah, these ones here are bear prints. Um, the bear prints are actually the ones that lead you to the ending of the game. Um, so for that reason, I won't go all the way to the end of the trail. Um, but yeah, the game ending does take place here at the top of the mountain. And everything, uh, there's kind of a culmination of seeing um, where the world is heading um, once you reach the end of this trail. Um, yeah, I, I might give like a little quick sneak peek. Uh, actually, you know, I, I think I'll leave it up for people to decide if they want to play or not to see how the ending uh, finishes. Um, yeah, um, but this game um, was really, really fun to work on. And uh, I had never really worked on much environment art. So um, my main focus was working on Fox um, because I would consider myself more of like a technical artist, uh, character artist in rigor. So I had a really nice time working on a quadruped animal as opposed to just your typical uh, bipedal human animal or uh, bipedal human. Um, so that was a really cool thing to work on. When, and the texture of the design is really interesting too. It has almost like a uh, stuffed animal kind of feel to it to me. I don't know if that's what you're going for, but that's how I, that, it, it communicates some of that to me. Yeah, definitely. It it The way that I kind of saw it was almost like a velvety look. Mm. Um, and I feel like I wanted uh, to give the fox that look just to add to kind of this fantasy aspect of the game so it didn't feel too tied to reality. Um, yeah. yeah, I think um, that's pretty much all I have to share for today. Um, the game is on itch.io if anybody does want to play it. And as far as like future development, um, it, I, it's pretty much up in the air right now. I think that um, the ending of the game is like a good final ending. So at this point, I probably will be leaving at that. But there is also like always the possibility of expanding more on it and expanding more on this world and the environment, environmental storytelling that happens within this world. Well, if I can ask you, you, t you talked about, you know, you, you had to do all, you had to do all the hats for this and your focus on building out this environment. What, what kind of lessons do you feel like you you gained about environmental design from going through this? Because just the, the, the effect and, and when you're in there, it just feels so expansive. You just want to run around in it and the, the way that the fireflies kind of go off into the distance. So, I mean, what what kind of lessons did you learn, and, and what kind of tweaking did you, and experimentation did you do to get to this this effect? 
Yeah, I feel like something that I definitely had to consider a lot was making sure that there were enough areas to explore, but also that it wasn't too big to feel tedious to get around. Um, so I think that that was a really important lesson that I learned how to kind of balance the world so that the fox feels small in their environment, but it isn't frustrating for the player to not be able to get around fast enough. Mm. And then uh, you get these, the, if you can get uh, closer on one of these trees with the glowing, I think those are really great too, to get a little closer in on. It's just, yeah, um, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I wanted to add the glowing aspects so that um, it just kind of added like a pop of interest in like what's mostly like a very, very purple world. And I feel like with the glowing emissive, like uh, glowing orbs and the glowing parts of the trees, I feel like um, that added something like a to make the world feel like a little bit more special for the player. Definitely, definitely. Well, uh, so you said that you, you you think you might add in kind of more mid uh, if you were going to develop this out more something more in the middle and like yeah, not beyond the ending but putting something in in between uh and maybe like you've got that inspect action that the fox does right now that just it, it doesn't have any like effect right except that you you are looking at the thing and drawing your attention to it um what was your thinking like how did that develop for you yeah, definitely. I think that that definitely is something that I want to add in in future development is maybe um, spacing out the paw prints more. And then when the player inspects with the paw print, there's sort of like a magical trails of maybe these fireflies that will lead you to the next one. Um, that is definitely a goal that I have um, and something that I want to explore more. Because like you said, right now, um, the inspect doesn't actually have any real like mechanic to it it's mostly just like give the player the experience and feeling like they are inspecting something but i think it would really be a great addition to the game to give the inspect a little bit more of an impact on the gameplay itself mm. and then how about just like landscape design in general that you've done here i mean like how did you what were your thoughts of like why we're kind of like in a little valley with a river coming through um, I mean, did, did you cycle through any, any different ideas for like where exactly this would take place or what kind of, cause it, uh, you know, it's, it's a forest, but it's not this kind of dense forest you can still see in the distance. So you've done a good job with that. So how did that come about? Yeah. So, um, my, like my plan for how the layout of the map was going to go is that there would be this one area that's the open field. The next area would be the denser forest, which you can see here. And then there's this cave area, which is another kind of section of the map uh, is what I considered it. And then here you kind of have the cliff approach, which is the path that takes the player towards the very top of the hill where they reach the end of the game. Mm -hmm. So it's broken down into those, I think, four or five different sections. And... Um, That's fantastic. Yeah. Like, a, like a, you know, viewing it as these different, these different zones that, that come together is also a very like kind of ecological approach to it, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I wanted to make sure that it definitely felt like you are experiencing this from the fox's perspective and it didn't feel like the fox had any sort of magical powers or anything like that. I wanted it to feel like you are really performing the actions of the fox in this magical world. Oh, and I just caught the, the violet dawn itself, the, the moon over there. I think it was, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Hadn't, I hadn't noticed that before. So that's a, a great like reveal of coming up onto that hill because I didn't get up there when I played. Yeah, definitely. It's a very, uh, some subtle details, um, but there's definitely a lot more that you can see when you come up to the top of the hill and you definitely get a better perspective of the whole layout of the map from up here. All right, well, thank you so much, Millie. This is a, really is a magical experience to get in. Uh, I know that, um, my six-year-old uh, in particular, I'm going to like drop her in there as soon as we get off uh, Game Fest because I played it by myself last night, but she didn't get a chance to try it out. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'll be posting the link to the itch.io page in the YouTube chat, and it's also in the Sansar if anyone wants to check it out and find the ending of the game. Fantastic. Thanks, Millie. All right, now for our next two demos, we're going to bring on uh, my colleague Sylvia Rusanka.
Hey, Sylvia. Hi. How are you? Oh, I'm hanging in there. I'm enjoying the the Violet Dawn in there. Um, my daughter's named Violet, so I think oh, that cool. this is a game I really need to share with her. Yeah, see how she reacts. So just tell her that Millie named it after her. No, she won't know anything. <laughs> I think she'll be delighted by that. So this is actually my first game fest. I didn't get to go last year for for like, this was my second one since I've been here. This is my first one, so I've been really excited. Uh, what's uh, like? I don't know. You've been watching all these demos. What's I don't know. What, what do you? What's the vibe that you're picking up here? Any any trends that you feel compared to previous years? Things are standing out. Well, I think that this is so. This is the second year we've done it um, online with Twitch, and what I've really enjoyed about it is that uh, usually when you're doing sort of the more uh, conference convention sort of aspect of Game Fest, you don't have really the opportunity to speak with all the students and hear how they develop their projects. And that's been sort of the fascinating, awesome part of doing it on, on online and, and streaming. Um, you get to hear sort of what their inspirations were and how they came about with their styles uh, and what they were trying to do. And it's it's been awesome. And you can also, I think the having the comments from uh, people mm -hmm. watching to get that sort of reaction of how people interpret it, your game is really uh, an excellent addition. So I think, in the future, I would like to continue having served this kind of portion, um, getting there. Um, it makes me excited to, to see what other stuff our students will be coming up with and what's possible from that. Yeah, getting it really getting the best of both worlds going forward. Like we've we've learned a lot about how to do things online over the past year. So when we can do both at the same time, it's gonna be really exciting. Yeah, and it'd be something that we can also, uh, hopefully we'll be able to have other schools come back. I think that's, sort of missing from this iteration. Um, but, uh, you know, if we can open it up and have it sort of streaming next time, I think that would be really great as well. Definitely. So, all right. Uh, so thanks, Nick, for, for introducing me. Uh, hi, everyone. I hope that you're having fun watching everyone uh, demoing their games and talking about uh, what they're thinking about, what they're creating. Um, I would like to introduce uh, the next game, Ray TA, and I think Austin is there to talk about it. Hi, Austin. How Hello. are you doing? I'm doing good. How about you? Yeah, good. Yeah, so tell us, this is going to be a little different than some of the other demos that we've seen um, earlier. So uh, tell us a little bit about sort of uh, what this whole project, what Ray TA is and, and what you're hoping to accomplish with it. Yeah, so this is Ray TA. Uh, it's a project developed by me and Brian Mejia. Uh, we started it as a uh, RPI Arcos project, which is Rensselaer Center for Open Source. Uh, essentially, it's just we have our code available online for free. Um, and we wanted to design this as a sort of practice tool for MMO encounters, so things like World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy, because there are a lot of really good uh, online videos and uh, written guides, but there's really no way to practice these encounters and these mechanics in, sorry, <laughs> to practice them uh, other than inside the actual game. And usually those require upwards of 10 to 20 people to actually play them. So we want to give the player an experience to try these things and improve with them. So less time is taken in game when everyone's together. So I'm going to skip around a little bit. Um, okay. This is our party customization screen. So we have our tank units, which are our blue units, our healer units, which are our green units, and our damage units, which are our red units. So the player will control their whole party using the one through however many units you have uh, number keys. Each one is denoted here. So this tank is one, this healer is two, and so on. So this is the actual gameplay. We wanted to give a sort of top-down uh, overview kind of view. It's very similar to programs that log your uh, MMO fights. And it's a very familiar perspective for people who are hardcore into these games. So each character, you move around, uh, you select them, and then you can either click to choose a location or you can click to choose a target. As you can see, each of these units are targeting the boss, except for the healer, which is targeting the tank. Right now, there aren't any mechanics. Uh, we'll get into that in a sec. But 
the whole purpose is to let the player see the mechanics and experience them in more of a uh, hands-on experience. So if we actually go back to, actually one more thing. Um, so when a unit is targeted, so for example, this uh, DPS unit is targeting this boss, it'll perform its action. So damage units will damage, tank units will also damage, but they'll keep, or keep uh, the attention of the mob more and the healer units will heal. So currently we only have that um, automated experience because we want to focus on the mechanics themselves as opposed to the more specific uh, game things like rotation and cooldowns and things like that. So we're going to actually go back to our encounter designer. So we created a sort of uh, visual scripting system so that the player can uh, design their own encounters. And it's also so that eventually when we produce this more, we can work on the actual tool and other people can actually uh, import and create the encounters to practice. So right now we have these blue nodes, which are the execution nodes. Uh, this start and this update are linked to Unity's uh, built-in start and update. So uh, the start here will start when the encounter starts and the update will happen every frame. So I put in because currently we don't have a way to spawn in new um, new nodes on the fly. So I put in a couple to show like an example uh, encounter. So first we're gonna spawn a new NPC uh, with a given unit ID and a given location. Then we're gonna do a sort of uh, pseudo loop. So we're going to loop and wait five seconds then we're going to use one of these built-in functions, which is specific for Raytier slash Unity, where essentially we damage the raid, which is your party, for a specific amount. Then we're going to wait again for five seconds, and we're going to spawn a spell. This is our, uh, our way of saying we're going to spawn some sort of mechanic. So this mechanic is going to be a red circle on the ground that the player will have to move out of. And then we're going to take a random player location. So it's going to get one of the random party members. And we're going to go from that. So then before we get into the actual encounter, we have our party creating uh, and customizing screen. So we can place our units. We can edit their stats. So for example, if I want this tank to have maybe double the health um, and then some extra damage, actually we'll turn damage down a little bit. So uh, you can actually customize because you, you can actually customize your party. So, for example, if you have a couple players that perform a little under the, the average, you can turn down their damage and try to simulate the encounter more accurately. We also have the way of saving and loading the party. Right now, it's only locally. Um, in the future, we do want to implement um, uh, importing and exporting so people can. Uh, share this with their friends and their other raid members. So for now, I'm just going to say this as demo one. And I actually have another uh, set, which is demo. So if I can load that one. And it'll load everything, including the stats and the positions. So now we're going to get into the actual encounter. So the unit spawns. Then we're going to wait five seconds. And then the entire raid gets damaged. So the healer has to heal everyone up. And then we also have this spawning AOE that we have to avoid. And the encounter loops and keeps going. And that's what we have right now. Oh, uh, I think what I love is just the, the layers of customization that you're building into it. I think that that is really exciting. Um, and also sort of the simplicity that you have in your tool that um, you know, it really gets you to to the main points that you want to to focus on. Like the the colors are, you know, you you see it, you know what's going on. Uh, and if you go back to the other UI, I mean, you have there just like very um, basic here. I love sort of that you're doing the the visual um, sort of programming here. I, I like to see sort of this kind of expanded a little bit more, um, and. Uh, serve this this also being able to uh, load external files so that you can 
um, play out. And I know that in the past, we were also talking about having some way of also tracking your stats, uh, stats as you're, you're playing uh, or training, um, which I think that maybe that asked me like sort of what are your future goals for this? Do you, are you planning on working on this uh, some more in, um, over the summer or, you know, as you, you move on? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is extremely early. Uh, this specifically this uh, visual scripting system just happened in the last couple weeks, I think. Uh, so as far as this part goes, we definitely want to expand it more functions, more ways to add uh, nodes in real time so that people can create their encounters and really customize them and try to make them as accurate as possible. As far as the party system goes. Um, I mentioned before the importing and exporting of parties, um, which really your raid leader can create your party and then really customize it and then give it to your raid members for them to practice. As far as what you're saying before with the stats on the side, that was actually a really good, uh, really good idea that we want to implement. So we want uh, there to be essentially a log of every single thing that happens on the right side of the screen here, where you can see like unit one dealt damage to NPC one at this time, this much damage and et cetera. So it's, that really gets into more of the stat tracking and practice type stuff. Uh -huh. So we want to be able to have those events and be able to go back to those events so that someone said, oh, I messed up here, let me try it again. The other thing we want to do with that is we want to be able to have the player uh, really be able to see like how they did. And at the end screen, like the you win screen that you saw, we want there to be stats, like how much damage you did, how much avoidable damage you took, how much you healed, things like that, so that the player can see, ah, I can improve in this specific area and uh, try and practice again. Yeah, so um, I have like a couple questions. We only have like three minutes left or so. And I was like, I have actually a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, and one of them is, is just um, how is, is making a technical tool for you know this, this kind of training different than say programming for a game itself? Like which, like what are the things that uh, you find sort of exciting about either one of those or different about the process of, of thinking about sort of making a tool specifically to, to aid a player. Yeah, so specifically specifically for this, as opposed to making things for games, I was able to take this extra time to make sure everything is as clean as possible and is as, mo is as modular as possible so that we can add things in the future and they can seamlessly go into another. So it really gave me that extra time and give uh, Brian as well uh, to focus less on the game design aspect and more on just cleaning up our code and making things really smooth. Yeah, and then um, my, my last question is, um, so also you said that you did this part um, partially through Arcos. Um, so are you planning on making this available to people to maybe add or modify it or use it for their own training? And uh, Yeah, so right now we have a GitHub link, uh, which is completely, or completely open source. You can grab all the code and things. Um, in the future, I think we're going to branch off a little bit um, and try to develop the tool more and try to... It's going to take a, a long time, I think, but try to... Uh, make it more public and try to uh, more make it more specific per game. Uh -huh. uh, so for example, World of Warcraft has different mechanics and things for Final Fantasy. So we need to, I think, specify more and just add more and more features. Yeah, this could be a never ending project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly. <laughs> Well, this is this is great. Uh, I love to uh, how I saw the sort of the evolution and even sort of the beginning of where it was before, and you retranslate it. So I I'm looking forward to to seeing this in development in the future. So thank you, Austin. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, um, so next we have Sam O'Connor with his game "Doggone It to Hell uh, to Heck." <laughs> <laughs> I will never ever <laughs> be able to. <laughs> the heck just seems weird. Um, so hi, Sam. How are you doing? 
Hi, Sylvia. I'm doing good. Coming off of my uh, second dose of the Moderna vaccine, and we're powering. <laughs> um, how are you today? Oh, good. I'm excited to 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 uh, have you talk about your game and share it with people. Do you want to tell us a little bit about sort of uh, what's going on here and its spookyish <laughs> aesthetic? Sure thing. So uh, this is Dog on It to Heck. It's a, a top-down 2D puzzle game uh, with some 3D elements mixed in. Uh, this was developed for the GSAS capstone class, and it was a group of five, including myself, Sophie Richards, who was our programmer, um, Dylan Bachleman, who was our writer and level designer, Nick Paterno, who did our environment art, and Austin Jacobs, who just presented, was also a programmer that helped us out. Um, and Dog on It to Heck, as I'll get started here, is just um, this game where you play as a dog walker in hell. You've been doomed to eternally walk the dogs of the residents of hell, and you have to do your best to solve puzzles and meet the demands of all of the people in hell in order to hopefully get your way out, your ticket out of hell. Oh, and I wish it would load quicker. I have to apologize a little bit. Um, my laptop is a bit... Um, the anticip anticipation. It's all about that sort of dramatic moment, <laughs> the <we> reveal. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta wait for the reveal. So, um, we start off with some dialogue welcoming you to Heck. This is our main character right here. Um, something to note right off the bat is that we played around with a lot of different art styles while we were developing this. Uh, we were really inspired by um, comic artists a lot. Artists that use um, their like own vocabulary to come up with shapes and ideas to relay like what a human looks like or what an animal looks like and things like that. Artists like uh, Alex Graham and Alabaster Pizzo, if you want to check them out on Instagram, they make really good content. Um, my laptop is doing its best, and I'm so sorry about this, but I'll try and get through this. So this is a little bit of the uh, introduction to the game, how things work. Um, you're going to end up seeing that a lot of the dogs that you end up walking alongside are a bit, um, they're a bit strange. So let's grab this key right here. Head on up to the first house, and we'll get our first job. It's Casa Maria Gracie, and she's going to give us Casper, her little ghost dog. So it's our job as the dog walker in hell to make sure that Casper has a good time, and that we rescue all of his treats, and make sure that he's doing okay. So first off, just to showcase, we can walk Casper around, switch between uh, whichever character you're moving, and um, if we want to take a look at Casper's abilities or things like that, we can go into the little doggy binder that we were given. We'll see all the objectives here. We've got to get Casper, pick up the, all of his treats, go to the gate and leave the area. And then if we check out here, we get a little bit of backstory on what Casper's all about. He doesn't really need to eat, um, but he loves ecto bones and he can float through fences like they aren't even there. So. That'll help us uh, figure out what we need to do next. So while we're getting all of his treats, we're going to just have a good time with little Casper here. He's such a cute puppy. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of the inspiration for uh, the dogs here um, came from Tim Burton. Tim Burton is uh, very uh, famous for always including some sort of like interesting uh, dog sidekick to our main characters. So that's where the inspiration for this little guy came from and from another dog that we'll see in a moment. But right now I just want to show off um, that there's this locked gate here with the key behind it. We can't really quite reach it, but it just looks like Casper might be up for the job. So we switch to Casper and then waddle him through the gate. <laughs> and there we go, he picks up the key. Now we should be able to progress and go through into the garden. Now we've got two more treats here. One that we can reach ourselves. Ooh, if my computer decides to allow me, there we go. Um, and then Casper here is going to be the key for us to get the next little bone hiding behind that gate. Can't quite reach it from where I'm standing, so let's move a little closer. And there we go, we're able to grab it. All right, come on, Casper. 
move on and check out uh, the other level that we have uh, to show today. Let's get out of here. So we beat that level. Oh, we did it pretty quickly. We're the best damn dog walker in hell. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, you got to beat the heat, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it seems that Casper wants to keep walking with us. So let's continue. Might get another moment of suspense here as my computer desperately. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so here we are. Next level. Casper's still hanging out with us. He's such a good boy. But there's another job waiting for us here. But uh, it looks like we got to get another key before we can go there. So let's have Casper come all the way over here, please. Come on, buddy. He's a bit stubborn. <laughs> yeah, that, it said so in his little bio. <laughs> oh yeah, he's got a little, he has a tendency to wander off, not want, really want to follow you as much. But I mean, if you do a good job with him, you might just find that he's not so bad. So we got another house here. Let's see if there's another job waiting for us. Oh, we got Benjamin Rounder. He's gonna uh, pawn, us, pawn off a little chihuahua on us. Oh, they, there's, there's such a cute little uh, <laughs> matching <laughs> dog parent dog. There both, of them, both of them look like they're capable of violence, I think. Yes. Okay, so as Benjamin Rounder just told us, so let's switch it over to our little friend. This here is Stuart the Chihuahua. And Stuart, uh, as Benjamin told us, is a bit, um, he can cause a lot of havoc. Uh, he's got the ability to, as most chihuahuas do in the real world, breathe fire. So, <laughs> oh. I'm experiencing a bit of lag on my end, so I'm sorry if there's lag coming through. Um, but I do want to showcase that Stuart here has the ability to help us proceed and get a few of the things that we need to go forward at the level. Also, if you see, we've got a little shader going on where you can see people behind um, walls and things. We've got a bit of an orthographic perspective uh, where we have 2D objects that are interacting in a 3D space. That was something that we had a lot of fun playing with as we uh, made this game. So as you saw right there, uh, Stuart was able to burn down a hedge so that Casper can cut through and get us a key. Here I think there's, yeah, there was a bone here that we couldn't get before. Although Casper might be a ghost, he can't really go through hedges. They're a little too they're a little too like sticky for his liking. So let's switch over to Stuart. And let's burn these bad boys up. Once again, RAM usage allowing, right? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that about uh, culminates what all dog on it the heck is all about. Um, you just got to complete these tasks, do your best, do your best for yourself and the dogs, and who knows, maybe after enough working, you'll be able to finally get out of there, get your ticket to whatever the heck equivalent of heaven is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I was good questions like, so um, with this, I, what, what are some of the sort of um, maybe issues that your team encountered with, while making it and um, you know, how did you overcome sort of some of those issues? Right, so um, we're all seniors. So as I mentioned before, this was made in uh, GSAS Capstone and uh, it's been a rough year as we all know. And um, it was especially rough on, a, on all of us because we all had so much going on along with the stress of trying to graduate and trying to find jobs out there in the real world. Um, so it was a bit tricky to manage our time the best we could. Um, that was probably the biggest roadblock. We had problems making sure that things were done on time and that we'd be able to meet deadlines that we needed to meet. Um, but it ended up working itself out as it always does, you know. Um, we definitely wanted to make sure that we were still doing our best. So we implemented things, um, and this was even advice that we got from the games company that we worked closely with on this game. Um, their advice was always just make sure that you're planning out your time, that you have uh, checklists of things that you need to do, 
and you're going back and editing those checklists every day based on uh, things that you're capable of doing today and maybe some days you're not capable of doing it. Um, so it came down to managing Trello lists and spreadsheets and all the things like that. And ultimately our time management came together and it all worked out. Yeah, um, I really, I, I'm glad that you were able to add the second dog because I think that really uh, kind of showcases the overall game and sort of the possibilities in there. And I, I want more dogs now. I want to see oh, what yeah. the next dog is. Um, <laughs> we had loads of plans. Yes, they're they're ultra cute. I kind of, uh, I, I want to have a little ghost dog myself or a little chihuahua with a little, uh, uh, the chihuahua is a little terrifying. <laughs> it's got those yeah, he's eyes got demon that eyes. just like are it's searing. <laughs> <laughs> they burn into your soul. So, um, <laughs> there. Um, and uh, do you think that your team would, or anyone in your team would like to work on this further, or do you see this as sort of the like a nice kind of culminating sort of I think piece? This, this did kind of culminate into a nice portfolio piece that I think all of our team members could be proud of. We did have a ton of ideas that we really wish we could implement. We wanted things like affinity, where you could um, be more comfortable with the dogs and they could be more comfortable with you. And that would let you do more things and accomplish more tasks. We also, of course, wanted to add more dogs because we just can't have enough dogs. We wanted uh, things like a three-headed pound that you'd have to like carefully walk him through a level where you'd make sure not to destroy like precious property and things like that. Um, but yeah, we'd all love to work on it some more. It's just the question of um, we're all seniors, we're all making our way out into the world. Like how much time are we going to have on top of finding a job out there? Yeah, no, but it's great. I totally, um, I enjoy playing it. Um, and the, the whole aesthetic came together in a very uh, interesting, unique way, which is really exciting. I love sort of what uh, you did with the sort of the, the shaders for both the lava and the shaders for uh, when they go behind the, the wall that really um, works out well. You have a great sense of space in here. Um, so I, job well done on this. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, so thank you, Sam. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for it. That was it with our demos. And uh, now I'm going to hand over uh, our time to Dr. Eric Amaris. Um, I don't know, like, are we still doing a little bit of trivia as we are? I, I don't know, how can you follow up a demon chihuahua with anything but, I, I just. Well, you can't, right? <laughs> that's just over the top. I think over the top, that's amazing. Um, but yes, I, I am, as as those of you, and I think more and more, uh, I think you know, just about everybody is, should be familiar with my infamous deck of trivia cards these days, which I of course have at the ready for just such an occasion. Um, so we could, we could do that, we could do that for a little bit. Okay. And the good news about it is this is a brand new deck. So I know that I have not asked any of these questions in any class yet. So, so fresh, this fresh is fresh and new challenges. Well, these are here. fresh. These, these are certainly, some are old, some are new. I mean, I don't know. Let's see the date on here. Um, certainly they're not going to be like this year's releases. So this is, we're, we're, we're talking, you know, anything. I know there's like 2017 in here. I know that. And, and so on. So we'll see. There should be some good ones. There's, there's usually some good ones. I've had good results. Our <laughs> students are good. And if they if they don't have the answers, I'm sure Sylvia or someone else will. So oh no, I, I'm, I'm the someone one will be uh, ready in in the in the comments. That's the if key. Any, so, if there's trivia about '80s, you know, obscure '70s and '80s TV shows, well, you'd be I'm surprised. your gal, but <laughs> you'd be surprised what's in here. Um, so, <laughs> part of the reason for doing this is also this is this is definitely we're going to have some. Um, some uh, I just heard a disconnecting noise. I'm hoping I'm still here. That's that's like the bane of my existence. Um, my mouse will run out of juice or something like that. Hasn't it been a great you know year and a half for that now? This is like terrifying. But so uh, this is also meant to to kind of get us ready for the more interactive. Uh, well, I guess all day has been a lot more interactive than <laughs> I had, had thought, uh, and a lot more personal than I than I kind of imagined too. I think we're getting we're actually all kind of getting good at you know, kind of 
relating to one another via these little cameras and things, which is kind it's of a very bizarre experience, right? So it's uh, it's wonderful and scary at the same time, right? I feel like I'm constantly under surveillance. That was the thing. And there's even we <laughs> just so so the audience knows there's a green room sort of thing that we have here and that we sort of like log into. And and I just, you know, you forget about it because you're just logged in and then you're like, oh my God, what have I been doing while well, my camera's been live? You know, somebody's watching somewhere as I'm like, you know, trying to <laughs> be all like whatever goofy things I'm doing, but seriously. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, uh, before I, before we introduce our, our keynote today, uh, I wanted to, to kind of make sure we're in, we're in the proper kind of interactive mode, which I, uh, you know, like I said, it doesn't, you know, this is gonna be some opportunity toward the end of the, uh, the keynote speech to actually do some, some back and forth and some questions and things. We'll be around for that. So this is going to make sure that you're all ready at the keyboard and paying attention and so on. Right. Um, and and we'll we'll just start for this and not use up all my time just talking about it. I should actually do it. So, um, so the first question: dun, 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 dun. Which game in the Gex series was the first to be a three D title? How many of you are familiar with the Gex series? Gex the Gecko. Come on. Oh, I, I didn't give away the game, but anyone, let's see. I don't know if there's a lag. Gex 2? Well, it's not enough information. We're gonna move, <laughs> we're gonna move quick here. This is the speed round. Ready? It was Gex, enter the gecko. All right, here. Now more recent game. <laughs> Gex 3. Yes, Gex 4. No, no, it's Gex 5. <laughs> it was one of those. Replacing Tiger Woods. Now, this is an unusual one. We don't, I don't see a lot of sports game stuff. We that's that's I don't know if that's in our wheelhouse, out our wheelhouse, this kind of a thing. But let's see. Let's see what happens here. Replacing Tiger Woods, which golfer became the new title athlete of the PGA Tour video game series in 2015? Anyone? Any golfers? Anyone who follows sports video games? Gex to Electric Boogaloo. Not the right answer, but a good one. We're still, we're, we're a question behind. <laughs> Rory McIlroy. I know this is, I guess this is the real hard part, right? So Dave Crocker. I don't know. Am I? Okay. Now I this one, on. I will be disappointed if I don't get a lot of great answers on this one, because this is, I, I saw this one ahead of time and I had just been looking at this because, because it's one of my, anyway, this is a good one. PT. PT was a playable teaser for which canceled video game highly anticipated but ultimately canceled video game wait someone says wait <laughs> resident evil 5 silent hills hills multiple hills we had silent hill we had silent hills bunch of bunch oh, of alien, uh responses on there <laughs> it's the hills. Yes, 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 yes. So that was a good one. All right, all right. We'll, we'll, we'll one, one more. Maybe. Oh, this is a good one because this is a classic, and everyone should know about this in studying video games. So I think I think there'll be lots of responses. This one created by Lucas Pope. Which 2013 video game is set at the border of the fictional country of? And I always have a hard time saying this. Our our sto Ska, or Stotska. People should know this. Papers, please. All right, that's a good one. Papers, please. That's excellent. We, we talk occasionally about that one. We've had a couple of people like developing their own kind of versions of that in, in, in some various classes. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there because I, I, I can't really compete. And I actually, if for those of you who know me as well, normally I, I speak off the cuff a lot. And thank you very, thank you. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Thank you for everybody. Normally I'm a very off the cuff kind of speaker, um, but I had to like write down some notes because there's just so much I have to kind of squeeze in to before, before we kind of kick things off here. So uh, first I wanted to take a moment to mention the amazing work that we've seen here, here so far today. You know, the, the, the amazing jobs that all the students have done Fantastic, and the judge is gonna have a hard time. The judge is gonna be off now uh, uh, working on things, trying to figure out what's going on. 
But one of the things that I noticed uh, and noticed today and, and noticed throughout is there's this sort of amazing trend in the demos today and, and in game development as well, which is we're, we're seeing this wonderful uh, uh, strength of narrative, right? This narrative art and character development, so much so in, in a lot of the games we saw today, you know, the mood, the you know, kind of the, the way that we're immersed and drawn in by the characters and the images and the environments and the stories, which is which is really really great. So just so many of them, so many of the projects really sort of oozed that personality and really connected with uh, with the players in a real personal way, which was fantastic. And of course, there's also some tool making, and I have to call that out because I think that's going to be a, another fun thing that we'll we'll. Uh, talk about as well. So there's these wonderful lines between art and entertainment and media and games, and it's becoming more and more entwined, which is, of course, the perfect lead into the keynote today. Now, hopefully I'm noticing as my, I'm, I'm, my brightness is going in and out. Isn't that great? But anyway, so over the course of the pandemic, uh, a lot about daily life has obviously changed for all of us. We've all come to rely on the internet way more than we ever have, including for what were traditionally group activities, like what we're experiencing today and classes and so on. And not for just sort of the, the mundane, but also for entertainment, right? Things that we would normally go out and experience with lots and lots of people. Hopefully I heard that disconnect again as well. If, I, if you're not hearing me, somebody jump out and warn me, but um, maybe it's hopefully just a, a mouse or some other device. So, um, where was he? So there's no surprise for us here in the game community, right? We know we've been connecting. We've been connecting with massively multiplayer games and so on, connecting as communities uh, for quite a while. But um, another big change that normally people would go and collect gathering groups for is like, you know, a lot of uh, entertainment, right? Specifically going to movies, right? So uh, this sort of big change as the, the emergence of streaming as a platform, what used to be reserved for the first run movies, the big theatrical releases. Something is, is clicking on and off just violently in the background. Hopefully it's all still working. Um, <laughs> so what I mean by, what I mean by that, you know, the traditional blockbuster entertainments, right? Now, we've all switched over. I don't know, maybe not all of us, but I know I have, for example, like I'm not the only one who has binged on the Mandalorian and WandaVision and the Falcon and the Winter Soldier and lots and lots of other movies and other things that normally I'd be going out to the theater to see because they I had to see them on a big screen, right? So things have changed. So we're obviously changing how we consume a lot of our entertainment and how we engage with it and so on. But what a lot of people may not have considered is what that impact of things like the pandemic and technology and so on, what's the impact on production of those forms of entertainment? And how did life change for the folks at these, this sort of different front line, you know, that are used to these big things, these big, you know, productions and so on. So changes in production certainly are no, but by no means just you know, something that specifically happened because of the pandemic and working from home, but they also have to deal with constantly and rapidly changing, rapidly evolving technology as well, right? So these, all these things sort of hitting at once. And fortunately today we have this great fortune of having a longtime friend of mine here today to, uh, to hopefully shed a little bit of light about what goes on behind the technological scenes on some of these typical projects and how they've been changing and to give us a glimpse of sort of what what to other people might feel like the sort of the less glamorous side but for us here in the program probably much more likely to be the side that we interact with in our careers and in our future endeavors those sorts of things so that kind of the technical side the real kind of behind the scenes side so let me introduce to you, uh, I have a, a little bit more background. So uh, Blake Sloan is a good friend of mine. I'm very happy that he's here. I roped him into this. I, he's gonna be, you know, the next favor is all his. So um, he's a senior engineering, a senior image pipeline engineer at Marvel Studios, uh, but he has had a broad career woven across a spectrum of creative, artistic and technical projects starting with, well, maybe not starting, but where, where we first met back at Onto Technologies. We're both on screen. Hey, Blake, how are you doing? 
um, at Onto Technologies, but he's been at Ultimate Corporation, Pixel Monks, Pacific Title and Data, Digital Domain, Method Studios, and currently, of course, at Marvel in you know the House of Mouse. So we'll say there's even you know connections to some other places there as well. So you may have seen his work, maybe uh, on such titles, uh, such movies as Speed Racer, The Fast and Furious, Iron Man, Iron Man Three. I guess is the specific one I found. Uh, Ender's Game, Thor, Tron Legacy all the new Marvel streaming series, and of course, what I consider to be the epitome of the action superhero genre, which was uh, You Don't Mess With the Zohan, right? For those of you, I, it's, I need a laugh track, and I don't have that. So that's, that's gonna, <laughs> Blake, please help me out. You have to chuckle then. So on, on, that, uh, on that note, I'm gonna turn it over to, to, to Blake to uh, take it from here. Thank you so much for uh, being here, Blake. Oh. oh, thank you very much, Eric. You have really set me up well, and um, I hope uh, I hope it doesn't disappoint. Um, welcome to Game Fest 2021. I've actually just seen the last three demos, and I'm uh, really glad I did. I, I um, I'm I'm impressed. I have some questions of my own, but I'll save them for the question and answer. Um, my name is Blake Sloan, as Eric said. Um, I work in production technology for Marvel Studios, um, and that's in Burbank, California, uh, otherwise known as my bedroom um, for the last year. Um, this is my first keynote. Um, I'm not this red, but I think this LED that is shining on me is making me look kind of pink, which is fine. Uh, looks like I have a sunburn. Um, so in the weeks leading up to this uh, to this talk, uh, I was trying to think of things to talk about that I could really sort of um, say enough about the subject to make an interesting talk that would last <clears throat> the better part of an hour. And um, and I don't I'm not really a gamer, and I'm not really a game developer. Uh, so so I I really there isn't much I could do to go down that path. Although I. I decided that I would talk a lot about uh, about some games that I um, really that I learned and played as a kid. Um, so I that that's some of what my talk is going to be about. Uh, my my job title, as Eric also mentioned, is uh, yeah senior imaging pipeline engineer. I think I've referred to it as senior image and color engineer as well, and it's an inflated title. Um, the senior is just because I'm old, and the, um, I, I'm going to just pause and make sure everyone can hear me because I, I'm not. Uh, all right, the, nobody's complaining in the in the channel. Great, great news. Um, I need a laugh track too, Eric. Um, so uh, the title of uh, the title is inflated, and I blame Hollywood for inflated titles. Uh, Hollywood has these um, things called executive producers that are also actors in the same movie that they're pro executive producers of. So they're doing two things really well, or or one of them isn't that hard. So that's that's my um, that's my example of job title inflation. Um, anyway, what I I, I will talk now uh, just kind of briefly uh, about what uh, we do at Marvel. I, I come from the past 10 years in visual effects uh, where I mostly wrote scripts to handle uh, pipeline stuff and did color management, which turns out is a big part of uh, visual effects. Um, but at Marvel Studios, I, we don't really do uh, visual effects ourselves. We farm them out to a lot of vendors uh, all over the world, as it turns out. Um, so we're not as hands off as a lot of uh, Hollywood studios who, who will mostly just give a bunch of money to a production company and they will spend it on things like uh, uh, dailies and visual effects and uh, well, food and everything that goes into a movie. Um, at Marvel, we keep some control over the raw live action footage and the visual effects that they that it gets made into. And so what kind of happens is a, a graph that I'm just going to show you with a lot of hand waving um, uh, of uh, uh, six to eight 
simultaneous shoots going on all over the world, sending us raw footage at what we call our plates lab, named after uh, what, what a VFX uh, raw um, uh, piece of footage is a raw element before the dinosaurs and explosions and monsters are added. Um, and the plates lab will uh, decode the footage uh, into a format that is that can be worked with by visual effects houses and then ship it out to any number of VFX houses, 10 or 20, say, uh, that, that sim simultaneously work on uh, multiple shows at the same time. They do their their work. Uh, they make their version one or version version 700 of a shot and they'll actually send it back to us and that will come into our uh, what's called a shot tree where um which is kind of a directory structure with every vfx shot in the movie um marvel cinematic features have about uh 95 percent visual effects so they're very few just straight live action plates that don't have some work going into them by a third party vendor so you can think of it as the entire movie uh, uh, going, following this pipeline. So, so somewhere between, I don't know, a, a few thousand shots, a number of shots in the low thousands, let's say, um, depending on the length of the movie and the, the length of the average cut. Uh, anyway, uh, shots come back uh, from the VFX houses multiple times, as it turns out, because they're reviewed and kind of uh, given notes and then they go back and they make the changes and they come back <clears throat> and eventually they're assembled into the you know into the cut of the movie and uh, and then they go through a process called color finishing which is very often also done on the lot where we uh, w where we um, package the final <laughs> the final piece of media to go out to um, either streaming or to uh, or to um, theaters. Um, so inside of all that uh, moving of, of, of images uh, is, uh, are, are several databases and web tools and, and command line applications and distributed rendering processes that, uh, that require integration. I mean, there's some sort of standalone tool writing that, that me and my uh, my teammates do, and then there's also a lot of sort of uh, plugins and integration that we write um, in a lot of languages, but mostly in Python. It's uh, that that's kind of the <clears throat> the the most commonly used language in in visual effects for non real time uh, work. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that sounds really interesting. Um, so I. I've told you a little bit, a bit about my work, and that's about as much as I uh, can say without getting even more boring. So now I'm going to just let you know that the part of the talk where I sort of make you familiar with my, well, I, my childhood, <laughs> my childhood uh, friends and the games I played in my childhood, then moving a little bit through my career and um, ending on a high note with some uh, fun things to watch. Um, and I've got a few videos uh, to show along the way. Um, so it begins with my dad, who um, was a copy editor of nonfiction books, which I, I don't even know if that job title exists anymore because it sounds like a carriage driver. Uh, but uh, when I was a kid, we would do well, sort of outdoor activities when it, when the weather was good. But then we would also, uh, say, well, he, I would bug him to give me some kind of indoor activities when I was young. Uh, and, and he came up with a few that um, I'm going to share with you. Um, well, one of them, um, I really just watched him do, which was uh, every now and then, uh, I, I would say every Halloween, but I don't think it was every Halloween. Every now and then he and um, maybe my stepmom would have to go to a party and he'd make a costume for, for the party, uh, if it was a costume party. And he would do this by uh, making an armature out of um, wire hangers, which are the kind that you get back if you take your clothes to the cleaners, I don't know if anyone does that anymore. And then he would uh, 
tear up a bunch of sheets and dip the sheets in starch, which is, well, a mixture of this starchy stuff and water that used to be used for making collars and cuffs very stiff uh, back when people wore clothes like that, which is, I guess now we're talking about the 60s. Um, and he would uh, cover the wire armature with, with, with these starch sheets and then uh, paint the whole thing uh, to look like um, some kind of creature or um, character. And the armature would kind of either fit over your head or your head and shoulders or the whole body. And, and in that way, uh, we, with his uh, great skills, I won a few costume contests when I was uh, still in my single digit years. Um, and that's really irrelevant. That's not a game. Um, I just remembered, and it sort of plays into some of the other things I'm gonna talk about later. Um, so the first uh, game isn't really a game, but it was using the, um, the really the most affordable and reliable display technology of the time, which is the 1970s uh, called paper. Um, and uh, flip books, which you've probably seen and heard of, but what I'm talking about are little either pads of paper or, or actual just books that are thick enough to draw either in the margins or somewhere along the edge of every page a drawing that is similar enough to the drawing uh, on the previous page uh, so that when you flip them quickly by rolling your thumb across the edge of the book, it makes a... Um, it, it makes the uh, appearance of continuous motion. I'm just gonna make sure that nobody's telling me I'm lagging. No, I'm good. Um, okay, so this is my first, uh, oh, actually, uh, okay, this is my first picture. Uh, the little guy is me and the big guy is my dad. I'll leave it up for a sec because I don't know if, um, if you can see that, okay says I'm all good and nobody's nobody's saying they can't hear me. So that's good. So uh, so flip books. This is the man who I thought invented flip books. And this is a flip book. Uh, this is one I just made uh, trying to prove to myself that it was still possible. Um, so I think what's great about flip books is that the work that it takes to make a little drawing on in the corner of a piece of paper, uh, rather the, you know, the margins of a book is not that demanding, but the result when you look at it, especially as a young kid is, is magical because you've made something move. Um, you kind of made this thing that really looks like, well, f physical, physical things in the world. Um, so uh, in that theme, another pastime, which is more of a game uh, that my father and I played uh, is, well, it didn't have a name, but I'll describe it to you. I, I call it telepicture because I had to give it a name. And the, Here's how it goes. You start with a newspaper photograph and only player one, well, it's best if only player one sees the newspaper photograph and he or she draws a grid of lines on the photograph uh, that, that makes some very small squares, maybe eighth of an inch by eighth of an inch squares. And then um, here, as, as I'm talking, I'll present. Um, then, uh, then, the rows and columns are labeled with usually letters in one axis and numbers in the other axis, although you could do it however you like. The important thing is that player two does the same uh, labeling on a standard piece of graph paper. And let's, let's play as we talk. So the, the, the game, I guess, is that the player one calls out the contents of every cell uh, as as dis, as concisely as possible, but also not leaving out any detail. And player two obediently draws what is being described by the player one. And in the end, uh, you get something that looks 
a little bit a little bit better than what uh, well than what a young kid might be able to produce on 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 his own. Um, so that that I've always uh, that was one of the things that my dad taught me that was fairly remarkable. And I I, I really um, I hadn't heard of the, any of these things. Of course, I was I was a young kid. But, it may be that there were quite a lot of parents who played these games with their kids, but um, I, I thought that it was fairly special. Um, going back to black. Uh, okay. So um, I, I have a, for, for each of these games, I have a little takeaway and they, they sort of converge on the same idea. And that's that um, these, these small incremental steps can, if, if, if you follow a set of rules, can kind of lead to much more kind of impressive behavior. <laughs> it can lead to a result that looks much more impressive than what you might have been capable of had you just sat down to, for example, um, create a moving object or create a, a sort of photographic image of a person without, without having learned the skill. Um, I'm going to leave the games of my father and me now and move on to a um, childhood friend who figures largely into my career. So I'm, I'm, I'm not just going off on too much of a tangent. Um, so his name is Danny Miller, or when we were kids, it was Danny. Now it's Dan or Daniel. Um, so I met Dan Miller uh, when I was in the sixth grade, and he was in the ninth grade. And uh, and he, most ninth graders wouldn't want to hang out with a sixth grader. I, maybe maybe you remember how you felt about sixth graders when you were in ninth grade, but it was unusual for us to be uh, friends so many years apart. Um, well, the, the, what happened was in, I guess it was around 1974, um, I was I was building a robot from scrap wood. I told myself, and I told anyone who would listen, I was building a robot. What I'd really done was just sort of make an elbow uh, with a hinge in it. That um, and and I was trying to think of some sort of uh, way to build an actuator that would sort of make the elbow flex. And I was going to, add, of course, I was going to add the rest of the robot uh, in in due time. And I uh, so. I, I uh, it was it was more of a puppet than a robot. Well, it was more of just as I described, uh, nothing terribly impressive. Although one thing I had done was uh, made a bunch of um, drawings that I kept in a drawer, an unused drawer in my brother's in my room, that were uh, supposedly kind of schematics and diagrams for the completion of this robot. Again, they were really just kind of a 12 year old's fantasy of what that kind of diagram should look like. So, you know, I, I was a kind of a, uh, I, I wanted to be a mad scientist. I was more of a, uh, more of a poser at the time. Um, anyway, uh, one day, uh, uh, the day that I met Danny, my brother had been playing handball with him and he came to our apartment. Danny lived upstairs uh, in the building that I grew up in, um, and and I just had never uh, I'd probably seen him in the elevator, but hadn't really formally met him. Um, anyway, he saw my robot stuff, and I and he asked about it, so I showed him all my robots. So I'm going to give you some context here. Um, so the two people in this uh, photograph. Uh, are uh, the guy with the glasses is me still, um, and Dan is the the little um, guy with the uh, tall forehead and long hair. There's only two people in the photo, so it shouldn't be too hard to. <laughs> yes, so that's Dan and me at about that age that I'm describing. Um, so uh, yeah, he he was. Um, I, I, we became friends. I um, ended up going up to his house, which was kind of interesting and messy. And and he and his brothers would um, 
we're, we're kind of louder and, and uh, uh, more opinionated than anyone in my family. So it was a very different environment. He also uh, was a tinkerer and, and, an, and an inventor and um, really, really the, the real deal. He, he, I, I was, um, I fancied myself a builder of robots, but here was, uh, Dan was, was really making things. He um, uh, was wiring together electronic circuits and um, uh, he uh, sort of rejiggered a, a, an acoustic guitar into an electric guitar um, and uh, had quite a lot of talent in these areas. I mean, I, I attributed it at the time to his being three years older than me, but at, you know, as as I grew, I, I learned that it was because he was kind of an exceptional person. Um, well, he he's exceptional, and I'm sort of average uh, in, in my opinion. Um, so, uh, I this uh, photograph is almost completely out of context, but I, well, I'm gonna show it anyway. Um, this is a toy that came out in 1969, uh, and I think it was available in both England and the United States. And what it was is a little race car that that would take a sort of like a punch card, but uh, a, a cardboard uh, card with a little graph paper grid in the margin that by, by cutting little 45 degree and straightaways uh, in, the, in the edge of these cards, you could program it to run a course. Uh, you, you cut a little groove or chop out a little piece on the left side of the card and it makes a left turn. On the right side of the card, it makes a right turn. The duration and, and uh, radius of the turn are determined by you know, the, the shape of the cut. Uh, so very, I, I didn't have one of these, uh, neither did Dan Miller, but my cousin Christopher did, and uh, I, I was intrigued by it. I thought that that's the kind of thing that I uh, approve of, <laughs> at least as a 12-year-old. Um, so the uh, Dan also showed me how to play a game on graph paper. I'm going to go back to my glowing face. Um, so he showed me a couple different games, and as it turns out, we played both of them on graph paper. But the first one was, um, I, I can describe to you uh, as we're watching the video, I think. Um, maybe I'll start with the rules, and then I will. Uh, ha. It's called Racetrack. Um, and for the game of racetrack, the players draw a starting line, a finish line, and some obstacles, maybe maybe an outline of the course um, on a piece of graph paper. Uh, and then they draw their positions, hopefully in different colored uh, pencils, their starting positions. Um, and now I believe I can start the video. So the rule is <laughs> that your first move has to be one, one step in any direction. Um, your second move can be the same uh, distance and direction as your previous move or one step in any direction from that position, from that projected position. Um, the effect of this is to make a path that resembles the physical path of a race car. Um, it also, uh, there are certain perils because you can crash into the edge or into an obstacle if you're not, if you don't budget your sort of velocity and your, and your angle properly. Um, so yeah, the, I've, this is an example of the full game. <clears throat> I tried to make it fast, but it, I may have to speed it up just to not bore anyone. <laughs> but I, I, this, this game is nice <laughs> because it, um, it, in the end, you you really don't know who's going to who's going to win. I mean, it's 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 not necessary. It's not really clear at the outset who's going to win. It's completely deterministic. Uh, I mean, in the sense that you you can't um, arbitrarily uh, set yourself up to win, 
but uh, anyway, I think in this example, the red player kind of one, one of the two, I think the red player crashes um, because he hasn't really budgeted his speed very well. Um, and then he has to start over by moving one step. Uh, that's, that's kind of the rules of a crash. Maybe you miss a turn and start over from moving one step. Um, anyway, racetrack uh, it got us through a few rainy days. And um, you can even play it with more than two players. You can play it on your own because it's kind of like a time trial and a test of skill, right? You can make sure that you don't um, that you don't crash into the side just because you're ambitiously, you know, trying to get around the track as fast as you possibly can. Um, yeah, I guess I'm most impressed by the fact that it, the path looks physical. Um, it's sort of it, the, the smoothness of those curves are not something that I, as a sort of um, <clears throat> dorky young kid, was capable of on my own. I, I and seeing them just sort of emerge on the track is kind of uh, kind of nice. We 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 didn't have a lot of electronics back then. A actually, um, yeah, th that would have to wait for the eighties. Um, there's another game that's even more surprising that we actually got anywhere with it on graph paper. And uh, I'll go back to my face for a bit. But um, that game is, uh, you've probably heard of it if you're uh, taking this course of study, but maybe not. It's called uh, John Conway's Game of Life. Um, and it, I believe he wrote it on one of the first computers in 1970. Um, and it probably wasn't anywhere near a real-time game at that point. It's also not properly a game because it doesn't really have players. It's kind of this, uh, this deterministic world that evolves and is kind of fun to watch. Um, so I'm going to go through the rules because the rule, because maybe there are two or three of you who don't know the rules. And then I'll show you how the game sort of evolves. Um, wind up being, oh yeah, oh great. Hey, I'm, oh, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep moving, uh, but uh, all right. Um, uh, let's go to game. Okay, John Conway's Game of Life. Sorry, I'm uh, getting, pinged on the um <laughs> on the uh chats so i'm going to maybe pause at each rule so that it can sink in uh cellular automata is kind of i think what um it's also called so if a cell is on and by that mean i mean if a square is filled so if it's <laughs> this is Zero or one neighbors sets its state to off. So by neighbors, I mean the eight neighbors, the eight values that, uh, the, the eight cells that surround a cell. That should be fairly clear. Um, and four or more neighbors being on uh, sets its state to off. So there are two conditions by which uh, an on cell can be turned off. And the third condition, um, if there are only two or three, precisely two or precisely three of the eight neighbors are on, uh, its it state uh, stays on. Uh, and then of course there is a single rule for off cells. If a cell is off, but it has exactly three neighbors, it will turn on for the next time step. So these rules go on, uh, just get applied every time step to every cell. And that uh, has an effect that if you were to guess what that effect was, um, just by hearing the rules, you might not imagine that something very complex could emerge. And drum roll, please. Um, oh, by the way, I'll, I'll paste this somewhere, but you, this is a nice place. This, is, this link is where I get, found this uh, example. Um, Forgive me for not making a graph paper animation of this, but it it would have used up the entire meeting. This is called uh, the, the entities in this 
in this universe have been given names by the researchers or lazy people, whatever you want to call them, who have um, uh, who figured out uh, various configurations that have certain behaviors. So those two first things are called stoplights, and this is called either a brick or a block. Um, and for obvious reasons, or maybe not obvious reasons, but the stoplights, every cycle, they change their sort of horizontal slash vertical um, orientation. Um, this next thing is called a glider. Um, a glider's behavior is really interesting <laughs> because it um, it actually moves. It, it kind of persists in this universe in a way that is, um, well, is sort of shocking in the same way that flip books and uh, and the curves drawn by racetrack and and uh, and the drawings that come out of of uh, of telepicture is amazing. It 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 seems like there's m the simple rules give rise to this kind of um, behavior that. I don't know if you could predict it just by reading the rules. You really have to apply them to a <laughs> to a universe to see how it will evolve. Um, I'm going to drag my mouse to speed this one up a little bit because this was a random set of dots. I'm sorry, it was not a random set of dots. It was a random configuration of three known types of objects that I knew would have some kind of effect, but I did not know that they would have this effect, which is that the glider that's originally going up and to the right, um, when when every, when all the smoke settles, is now going up and to the left. So it effectively is a maybe a, a configuration that sort of reflects something from it or bounces something from it. Anyway, this is all great, um, but the researchers that I was telling you about who sort of took the game of life and ran with it came up with a bunch of things that far more complex than gliders. For example, these things called cannons that create gliders and sort of endlessly generate them and, and fire them off. Um, and and here, here's what the game of life looks like in a bigger universe. And I think, I do speed up the time here, so it, it should, if there's no lag, it should be fairly clear that the thing on the left is a glider like the last one I made, but the thing on the right is one of these um, sort of big gliders that was discovered by, again, one of these researchers who's, <clears throat> who I should probably give credit. And because Eric says I'm, I'm <clears throat> rambling, I'm going <laughs> to drag the... Uh, So you can see that this sort of random pair of things just colliding into one another, again, they're not random. They're these sort of designed objects that are known to behave in a certain way, which is say known to move forward at a certain uh, pace or move in a direction. Uh, nevertheless, give rise to this kind of explosion of activity that results in a couple of gliders that I'm sort of swiping back and forth. So you can see that it just sort of spontaneously creates a few gliders that that sort of fly away from the um, from all this activity. Um, anyway, I'm I'm a <laughs> I'm a huge fan of stuff that um, behaves in ways that you might not expect it to, um, and that's uh, yeah, that's um, I think that wraps it up for the games that I played. Uh, I I, I want to cover my career in a way that will be coherent and that is impossible. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to spend uh, the next uh, five minutes on, on just a, a quick view of my career. Um, and uh, so, yeah, whoa, this is excellent. I've written so much. I've written more than 45 minutes worth of material, or, or maybe I've just been talking. Um, one interesting thing about uh, my friend Dan and I is that we uh, played in a band together. Uh, we formed a band in 
uh, I think in 1979, and the band was called Miller, 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 and Sloan. Um, this is what we looked like. Uh, and now this was a professional photograph by a guy named, I think his name was Jim Salzano, give photographer a credit. And um, this is what we looked like um, when we actually were playing music. Um, this was, I think, taken by my friend Leo Sorel. Uh, I'm the bass player. Uh, I was wearing the beret in both of these. So I'm, I'm the tall guy with the beret in the back and the tall guy with the beret on the, this guy over here. Um, we started a band. I um, uh, decided that the band was very important and uh, I <laughs> um, had no need to go to college because I was going to play in a band and I was also going to do my other job, which was uh, working at a woodworking shop in lower Manhattan, um, which I did for 15 years, the same amount of time and over the same span as I played in the band. So I really, um, up until uh, the my, my first tech job, which was for my dear friend, Dan Miller, uh, I, my experience uh, with anything technical, any kind of programming was, um, I, I actually have an example. This is a photograph of me uh, at the woodworking shop. Um, and this is uh, this is a few slides of a project that Dan and I built, um, which was an a, a, we, I think it would be called a MIDI driver now, but it was a um, that's Dan. Uh, I'm the sort of uh, lanky one with uh, glasses again, uh, the the non sunglasses. Uh, this was a. a electric bass that would um, take your hand inputs and turn them into notes, but it didn't really, uh, there were no vibrating strings. It was just a, um, it was a completely um, sort of switch operated uh, musical instrument that, that we actually played with the band for a while. Um, and good thing there's no time to uh, play music. Um, so, uh, I now have two minutes. No, I have about a minute to tell you <laughs> how my career went. And I'm going to tell it uh, from the time I started working at um, uh, Duck, uh, which became On2, which is the, the company that Dr. Amaris and I worked at together um, and went all the way to, um, oh, thanks. Yes, I'll go to black. Uh, and went all the way to um, uh, uh, my present career at Marvel. Um, I'm going to sh I'm going to give you a recap of my career, not in terms of the projects I worked on or the work I did, which you'll have to somehow get to somehow. But <laughs> but I'm just going to show you the Halloween costumes that I made and wore. Uh, over the years of my um, uh, color finishing and v uh, VFX and um, and finally vendor side uh, uh, VFX career. So 2007, I'm working at Pacific Title, uh, which is a company in Hollywood. Uh, um, oh, this is uh, my first year at Digital Domain, which is a company that does visual effects. Uh, they would have these uh, fairly big parties in their parking lot uh, for Halloween. And this was my costume. Um, say, this is also uh, from Digital Domain. This is, uh, I call it Garbage Man. Um, same company. I was there for about uh, eight years. So. Uh, uh, this is, I moved over to a place called Method Studios, which uh, is also a visual effects company, also doing color pipeline work. Um, this is, I moved back to Digital Domain 2015. Um, uh, this is in the sort of coffee room at Digital Domain uh, 2016. 
Um, you notice a theme. Uh, these last two were for Disney Marvel. Uh, 2018 was when I started it. I think it was October 2018 that I started at Marvel. And this was the first costume I wore to work there. Disney has a big costume contest. So I thought I've got to, I've got to nail this. Um, I'm a minute uh, over where I thought I would be, but uh, that's because Eric spoke too much. Um, I hope this isn't lagging. I hope you're getting uh, uh, enough of a flavor. That's my dog, Olive, who's uh, looking out the window uh, a few feet from me as we speak. And, well, this one might be a little long. I'll go to the last one and... Uh, all right. Okay. I think this one had a... A, a frame rate change, but this is uh, 2019, the last Halloween before the pandemic. Uh, 2020, I had no costume. Um, all right. I these this is a slide of photo credits, and it's an incomplete. Um, I, I believe the uh, newspaper photograph was by someone named Nate Palmer, uh, who's not listed here. And we can go to questions. Um, I hope you've had a great afternoon. Thank you, Blake. <laughs> so I knew it would be uh, sort of like what people didn't expect, which is sort of one of the reasons I, I wanted to invite you to, to, to talk today. Um, in that, can everybody hear me now? Am I, am I on? Did I get a thumbs up? Okay, I'm good. Um, in that immediately, I, and I get this question a bunch. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to throw it out, out there to you as part of it, kind of kicking, kicking the conversation off in that, you know, a lot of people come to things with a certain expectation. Like, what do I need to know? What is this one thing I need? What's the tool I need to use? What is the technology I need to use to, you know, to get into things, to be, to wind up being at the, at Marvel, the AAA studio and, and so on. Um, and I think, you know, in, in asking you, you know, would I be able to say, you know, but like, what is that one thing that, and I'm assuming the answer is, well, there is no one thing, right? There's, there's this, everything we kind of bring to the table, which is, I, I think, a, a great, you know, like you were saying, all the, the even the little things that would wind up being the picture that would emerge or all the, each of the individual moving slides that would become the video. And it's all sort of like things that build up there. Am I, am I being too well broad? I, I, I think if, if my talk had been two hours and I'd actually read the, my script, I'd have gotten to how, um, I actually got, uh, you know, hired by by Dan uh, to work it on too, uh, on too, because Eric might not have, uh, may, he may not talk about this in class, but they they developed a lot of um, a lot of the video codecs that are actually used uh, on the web now um, uh, for for internet video. Uh, they were bought by Google in 2010, I believe. Um, but long after I'd moved on or, or been shoved out. Um, but what I was going to say in answer to your question is, um, d don't underestimate, uh, your connections. Uh, I mean, you're having, having friends who are, um, who are, you know, highly motivated geniuses is something that's likely to happen when you're at a place like RPI and you're making... <laughs> making uh you know you're making your own video games from scratch you're, you're going to you're going to find people who uh will whose value as friends might be great and whose value to your life is unknown right so that that's um i i that's my I like nice that. way of saying that nepotism got me where i am today i don't think but it's, i i don't <laughs> think i think it's, it's a very important one because uh, you know i mean i know in general, when you talk about, you know, RPI and universes, you know, that, that, net, that network of people, you know, is something that is, that is, you know, 
a valuable thing. Um, it's funny. You can't like being, being in the color field. I'm sure he's like, all. Oh, this is the interesting thing. Like I'm colorblind, which, which why I like the violet game so much, but, um, but Blake is going to just color correct the heck out of everything. No, I'm have. actually, I have an led light <laughs> that I'm illuminating myself with. <laughs> All right. So yeah, I'm going to jump into some, because I know I, I promised, you know, or, or everyone, you know, I think nowadays speaking of the, you know, everybody assumes that that one tool, that one thing is, is going to be it. And, and there's lots of, you know, with the pandemic going on, everybody saw the, the Mandalorian and I've got to, I've got to kick this over to, to, to Blake a little bit. So everyone was like, Oh my gosh, video games are going to be how we make movies. Um, and the Mandalorian is doing some phenomenal stuff, some amazing things with the Unreal Engine. And I, and I, I you know, I mean, this is definitely not trying to belittle that at all, but I, I think it's a it's a reality check. And I wanted to throw that out to to you to see, well, okay, is that just the way, do you, does, does Marvel see the way that's going? Or is it, what about all these other skills and all these other areas? And, you know, what what do you think is happening? I mean, or, or have you heard? Well, okay, so, so, I mean, there are a few areas where I, I've noticed that that sort of game and GPU technology have made things a lot better, but all, you know, faster and, yeah, mostly better. And uh, real-time rendering is definitely one of them, or, or let's just say faster rendering. They're uh, traditionally, rendering is something uh, particularly rendering, you know, beauty passes, light and, uh, and surfaces uh, is something that takes a long time. I, we don't, we've never, I mean, my career has seen very little uh, sort of graphics rendering by, by video cards go into movies. Um, only in the last few years has that even been a thing. So, so, um, I, at least at the places I've worked, <laughs> mainly because they, well, because the technology <clears throat> wasn't quite up to snuff, uh, uh, but also because it's cost prohibitive. Like we we had um, a lot of, we had a huge render farm at Digital Domain and that, um, and it none of the machines had GPUs in them. They were just, uh, headless uh, render nodes. So that's changed. They, they do now and they use Redshift, which is, a, um, which is a render that relies almost entirely on graphics card. Uh, and, and, and sort of, I don't know if it's OpenGL, but OpenGL shader style uh, rendering versus um, whatever kind of, I, I mean, they're, they're effectively ray tracers. They produce photorealistic images. Um, so ray tracing is still the gold standard and probably will be. And as graphics cards get up to that point, I mean, now we do have some ray tracing going on, not every ray, every light and so on. So that's. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is. It, it, the, the thing is that there's style, you know, there's the kind of the feel of a piece. And for most of these sort of operatic VFX uh, heavy movies that, you know, like, and end game and things like that. You just want to be sure that it's, you know, a, a realistic rendering of yes, alien bugs or something <laughs> uh, invading. Um, so you're not, you, you know, any kind. So so I guess what I'm saying is there's no real stylistic reason reason to use something other than the state of the art. So as the state of the art. But there are stylistic reasons to just use whatever technology you have and it's to make something that appeals to, you know, sort of personally, right? I mean, they're, they're, I guess what I'm saying is Endgame is not the only kind of movie that, that, uh, it, that is in the world, right? It's, um, it, it's, a, it's a style that the films I've worked on has has sort of embra have sort of embraced right that 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 whole last say two decades of visual effects where you try to do very realistic physical simulations and very realistic light for you know i guess maybe improbable scenarios but um, now with the with the smaller i don't know if they're smaller budget or not i don't know anything about budgets but like the you know wandavision and well i guess falcon in the winter and the, the falcon and the winter soldier has much more of that same big budget cinematic quality to it, but not as many effects and so on. But but WandaVision is a very different 
very different kind of project. For, yes. Well, not well, project. Was, was a, uh, yeah, I, it was a departure. It's the one that I think my family actually watched uh, and enjoyed uh, as along with the rest of the, you know, audience. You know, I, I, I didn't, uh, most, I would say, I, I, it, it, uh, it was very fresh, I thought. Um, uh, they are lower budget. Um, they, I mean, in this, they, they're lower budget in the sense that they typically have a smaller percentage of, uh, VFX shots. So there's more live action that goes straight to color finishing, um, in the streaming shows than in the sort of big budget, uh, VFX shows. They, they spare no expense when it comes to the, the production quality, but they, they're, you know, sort of doing strategic, I think, storytelling that involves more sort of character stuff and less, um, yeah, space aliens invading. So I have a, a question. I, I, this is a great one to ask. So like on the outside, I think we all had our reaction, you know, of certainly the way Disney showed, again, to come back to the Mandalorian, kind of their big, you know, their, I forget what they call it, their, their stage that has all the LEDs yeah, in the back. The LED so wall like, or whatever. Yeah. So, so what was the reaction from other people in industry to that? When you, did you, did everyone be like, oh my gosh, this is the, like, what, what did you, or what, what might, what do you make of it? Um, so a lot of what goes on on set uh, by my, by my coworkers, uh, both in my current job and previous jobs with visual effects is capturing, uh, a scene that might be a, you know, a partial scene with a blue screen, uh, and some other stuff in it, but capturing the scene in such a way that all of the light falling on the characters can be reasonably reproduced. And that, so, so that means, uh, sort of taking these 360, um, high dynamic range, sort of multi-exposure images. In many cases, the sun is involved, in which case you, you have to do, you know, capture the sun at multiple exposures with ND filters so that its impact can be rendered as an environment, right? So they, they, they kind of do a lot of work to create an environment uh, or the, to capture the environment on the set. Um, as well as things about the camera, like how it, precisely how to unwarp an image to to rectify it for for say tracking. Um, so <laughs> the LED wall kind of makes that uh, less necessary, right? The LED wall kind of ex reflects light off the characters, you know, glances light off the characters that um, that is plausible for mm -hmm. the scene, right? So. So it's, um, it's, it, 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 well, it's a remarkable breakthrough is what it is. It's a, it's a really, because the kind of work that you had to do to simulate a character in a complex lighted environment is very labor intensive. Like mm -hmm. there's not just capturing the environment, but also um, well, if you know what the light stage is, it's basically a way to illuminate a subject with every possible, uh, you know, um, say, band of of light frequencies from every possible angle and then uh sort of drumming up a novel combination of those that looks just like your um your environment that you've captured so so if i could i because i want to look at it you know from a from a different perspective so from from what your perspective would be and maybe this is even the the piece of it that that as the lay person seeing what they're doing you know you say oh my gosh they're putting they they can film it as if they were really there on the set of or, or on the the surface of what whatever planet and so on but it's really from a production perspective it's it's almost more like a lighting tool it is it is another tool and then ultimately they may replace the background with a better version of the surface of whatever but the fact that they got that lighting on the characters and on the set pieces that are physical is is the big production win it sounds yes. like what you're saying yeah, it's a big post production win you're you're doing less work to um to sort of relight or or you know make make a plausible composite where yeah where a character or possibly a synthetic you know character or object 
really has the appearance of being integrated with the live action. Hmm. Um, so it's again, it's, it's more about the tool providing some some specific thing as opposed to you know what we might think on, on the yeah it's interesting. Well, um, I, I, if you've it was a technique I think in old Hollywood, say the fifties and before, to actually back project uh, you know just a film. Uh, and 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 shoot the actor in front of a back projected scene. Um, mm -hmm. You know, before there was uh, well, before there was ubiquitous blue and green screen. Hmm. Now, can you imagine other real time? I, I guess obviously that's the one because there's people on the set, and that's you know, the, the real time aspect of it. Um, in terms of now, you worked at Ultimat back in the day. I remember, and, and for those not familiar, Ultimat was you know when digital green screening. Before it was just like something that was done on every phone and every every application. That was that was a big deal, um, and that was a lot of that was you know some of the some I think some of that work was the real time green screening and and tracking was that. So, yeah, so well, Ultimat uh, made hardware for doing that stuff. I, I think we're getting close to the awards. Um, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> so I guess I guess I I just wanted you know these these things that we we take for granted. We see the glitzy piece, but then there's all these these parts that wind up being tools that that ultimately are what bring the value in and, and they they kind of bring themselves to um you know to the bigger picture. Um and I wish we had more time because it's like fun. I, I think maybe we should just done the whole hour back and forth my, and, and talk my about keynote things. wishes it had more time, but personally I'm grateful that that I didn't uh I was I didn't have the pressure. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so one last thing I wanted to mention because this is the other thing that I, I saw in a lot of games today. Another thing not to be not to be um, um, trivialized because I think we we take it for granted a lot of time. But what you were saying about lighting uh, and how important that is to you know the look, the feel, the story, and so on. And we saw in in a lot of games today, you know, this, there's some some really cool mood and stuff that's created with the lighting and what the game engines can do and so on. It's it's not something we see kind of upfront. A lot of the time, in terms of as we're developing a game, we think of the environments and the, whatever. But then that that piece of of what the magic that the lighting kind of adds to it. I wish I had more time to talk about about that and the potential for that as well. I'm gonna I'm gonna recommend some keynoters for for next year. Okay, all yeah, right, you can, fair enough. You can interview them. <laughs> well, if I, I'm I'm extremely glad that we could have you here today to open up the conversation. I wish we could go on more and and hopefully maybe. You know, we can have we should have a speaker series, and we're going to invite everybody from that you know. Uh, I'm so grateful for your um, invitation and for the opportunity to do this. Thank you, everybody who's who's who came today. <laughs> so I, I guess on that note, we're going to have to to rush out. And the main message is um, value every little thing, whether it's you know graph paper to light to whatever it is. That's where you know, the magic is going to wind up coming from all those relationships between the people you meet and the program stone zone taking up too much time. Thank you all so much for your attention. And I guess I'd better turn over now to our judges and the next piece of our day. Thank you, Eric. Um, and thank you, Blake, for that fantastic keynote talk. I could continue listening to this, the two of you talking about um, about this stuff for quite a long, um, quite a while longer. Um, that was that was really excellent. Um, but now it is time uh, for the final segment of our program today, the award ceremony uh, with our team of judges from Vicarious Visions um, at Blizzard Entertainment. Um, so these awards, this is where um, we recognize uh, outstanding effort, outstanding achievement and excellence um, in the student projects uh, that have gone on this year and this semester. Um, we look at excellence in different areas, um, in the artistry and the technical innovation, um, in the power and the meaning of the games um, that students make, um, and recognize them in all of these uh, in all these different categories. Before we get started, I just wanna take a minute again uh, to thank our sponsors. We bring that slide back up on here. Um, this whole program is made possible uh, by the generous support um, of Vicarious Visions at Blizzard Entertainment, uh, by the Nystar Divisions of Empire State Development, uh, and their support of the Center of Excellence 
in digital game development at Rensselaer. Um, and the Rensselaer School of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences uh, that houses the Games and Simulation Arts and Sciences program. And of course, our uh, media partner, Agora Media. All right, so now on to the awards. The first award uh, that we will be giving out tonight uh, is the award for uh, narrative excellence. Games are a great storytelling medium. We've seen this uh, kind of evolution of games uh, into ever richer, ever more meaningful ways of creating narratives and telling stories. We're seeing this moment of the evolution of storytelling into virtual reality, into kind of epic uh, grand storytelling drawing from cinema, but also a kind of a rediscovery, a renaissance of the written word of purely text-based games and all these different ways uh, of communicating and creating um, worlds through story together. Um, perhaps before we start with this award, I should bring up all of our judges so that you know um, who our team are. Welcome judges. Hey. So let me introduce first um, Steve Derrick. He's the Director for Organizational Development at Vicarious Visions at Blizzard Entertainment. Hello, Steve, how are you doing? I'm great, yeah, this is great. Nice, uh, nice talk. <laughs> right. Um, and with us also is Andrea Wilcoxon. She's an animator at Vicarious Visions. Hi. Uh, Andy, how are you? Awesome. Thank you for having me. And Michael Barba, software engineer at Vicarious Visions. Hello, Michael. Hey. Uh, hope you've been uh, enjoying the program all day. I just wanted to um, thank you all for um, all the work that you did in judging, the, judging these entries. Um, I want to say you all have had a, a pretty busy year over at Vicarious Visions. Uh, so I, you know, I mentioned Tony Hawk earlier, um, and there have been some other changes going on, and you're working on some interesting new games. You could say a say a little bit about what uh, what's going on at the studio these days. Yeah, I think uh, it, some, most people may or may not know, but Activision Blizzard is one company, but we we were working on the Activision side before. It's like Procter and Gamble. We worked with Clorox, and now we're working with Bird's Bees. But we, you know, with Activision, it's working with Call of Duty, Tony Hawk, those kind of games. And then we switched over this last year or this year to working on the Blizzard side. So now we're a Blizzard studio, and now we're working with uh, properties like Diablo and Diablo uh, Two Resurrected and uh, Overwatch and and games like that. So it's uh, it's really cool. Fantastic. Um, I wonder if the, if the three of you could just say a little bit about what you do, like what what your um, what your roles involve in the company, and maybe a little bit about what you're working on currently, in as much as you can disclose any of that. <laughs> yeah, should I go first? Um, so yeah, I'm a I'm a software engineer co-op. I'm working on um, D2R, Double Two Resurrected. Uh, I do I work on gameplay and UI like 80% UI, like 20% gameplay. Um, sorry if you can hear a lawnmower. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, so that can go anything from squashing bugs all day to implementing like totally new fe UI features um, and audio features. So yeah, a lot of fun stuff. Cool. Um, Andy, how about you? So Tell us I, what you're working on. <laughs> I'm on the cinematic animation team here at Vicarious Visions. Um, for uh, Tony Hawk was my very first title in the industry and actually did was on gameplay animation for that. Um, currently working on creating cinematic content for Diablo 4 and it's been absolutely wild. <laughs> so and Steve, I, maybe you could talk about like any of the many hats that you- I, Yeah, you I, I have a lot of different hats. Or... I think, uh, um, you know, I, I've been with the studio 20, going on 22 years. So it's a, a lot of different things. My uh, part that makes uh, it's interesting with RPI is I work with partnerships and developing partnerships with universities and uh, partner with recruiting, but also uh, HR and studio management and development and training and development uh, and working with like CEG and Empire State Development, those kind of things. So it's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff we do, but the main thing is that we try to make sure that we're a good partner within the capital region, the ecosystem, this gaming hub and building this gaming hub into even an even bigger, bigger 
gaming hub that it is. Yeah, it's an exciting time, isn't it? Some cool stuff. Um, all right, so let's get to the awards. Uh, so Michael is going to stay up here, um, and he will be presenting the first award uh, for excellence in narrative. Take it away, Michael. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so the excellence in narrative. So the finals for the excellence in narrative award all embody the great potential that video games have to not just tell a story, but to transport the player to an entire new world where we can interact with narrative in ways that were never possible in other forms of media. For the Excellence in Narrative Award, we were looking for a game that not only brought us memorable characters and an impactful story, but also writing that beautifully complemented the game overall in order to build an engaging new world for the player to explore. Here are the finalists for Excellence in Narrative. Excellence in Narrative. Cursed be Abigail Every Pollard. begins with a single step. So let me get this straight. You grow flowers from your skin that make things happen, and you have no idea how or why. Dear Diary, Mira Payanta, Annie Chang, Ely Hernandez, Tianjin Zhu, Amy Jill, Wenfei Peng, Dennis Chen, Josh Hacklander, Sebastian Martinez. The Inn at the End of the World. Sean Dunnigan, Sun Jung, Jimmy Jin, Brian Miao, Annabelle Prodnuck, Lucy Smithers, Miles Tyson, Sean Walsh. Hey, uh, so great job, all the finalists. Um, although I'm an engineer, I find that strong narrative has always left a much bigger impact on me in video games than anything else. And you've all created very memorable experiences that left an impact on me and anyone else who will play them. So great job, everyone. Um, so the winner of the Excellence in Narrative Award left the judges excited to meet new characters at every step of the way. Uh, each conversation we had helped us not only fall in love with the usually odd nature of the characters, but also taught us more about the game world in a way that perfectly balanced sometimes hilarious casual dialogue and world building. And the winner of the Excellence in Narrative Award is the Inn at the End of the World. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, our, our team, shout out to our writers, Lucy Smithers and Brian Miao. Uh, we worked really hard to develop this world and these characters that people can explore and relate to. And I'm so glad that resonated in this little game about human connection. Yeah, I, I, I found myself pretty sad once everyone had to leave after, like, at the, in the morning. <laughs> And I was always excited to see new people come in. So yeah, what, what inspired all these different characters? They all had such different personalities. Uh, well, some of them, like Arachne, for example, would be inspired by mythology. Some of them would be inspired by their visual design, which sometimes came before. But we just wanted to create these personalities that we thought would really emphasize um, the human connection of this world that we built. Yeah, it was, it's great. Definitely worked. <laughs> so yeah, thanks uh, to all the finalists for all the great entries. And um, let's move on to the next award. All right. Thanks, Michael. Um, so games are a multi-sensory medium. The sound of a game is something that can really draw you in and really make it memorable. A great soundtrack sets the emotional tone for a game. Uh, and games based around music and performance um, and this sort of connection between the interactivity of playing and composing music and the interactivity of playing and creating with the game um, is a deep one um, that has led to incredible kinds of creative fusions between these forms. Here to uh, give out the award for excellence in audio uh, is Steve Derrick. Hey, I'll be presenting the uh... Uh, category excellence in audio, sound design, music composition, and the use of sound and music as a core uh, design element. We're pretty excited this year. Uh, I've been to the uh, Game Fest year after year for quite a long time, and our studio has done quite a lot of music and rhythm based games with Guitar Hero, DJ Hero, and other things that may or may not have made it to the uh, uh, made it to the final. You know, sometimes they get cut, but we're excited to see so many games this year incorporating audio, but also sound and music and uh, bringing more immersive uh, 
game, bringing it to be more immersive in games and uh, definitely as a part of core part of the game as well. Let's take a look this year at our finalists. Excellence in audio. Our song, Brendan Rufo, Misha Pozniakov, Sean Dowd, Emmett Mayer, Ariana Pargin, Nate Nelson, Alex Insky, Junji Wan. Savior of Dreams, Christopher Pugliese, Hannah Bilger, Hoon Suk Beneni, Rebecca Braniak, James Piesco, Skip King, Brianna Geck. Stalagmike, Andrew Sirkok, Habiki Takaku, Xavier Marshall, Greg Sirkok, Tatum Hobby, Julia Krajic. Hey, congratulations, all you guys. There were some amazing things. There are some really cool. Uh, I, I did find out that I'm not as tonally uh, challenged as I thought I originally was. That was, uh, it was interesting. Um, as long as I'm humming, not, not actually singing, but the gameplay that was uh, in, each of these in each of these games, the audio was a major component and added a lot of value to that. Um, the finalist or the, the final winner of this is Savior of Dreams. All right, awesome, thanks. Yeah, yeah congratulations. <laughs> I think what interesting thing is we've had people actually making tools for note tracking and tracking notes and making sure that the you know everything fits in in, in sync with the music, and uh, your team did this in a in a much shorter period of time and and did a, did a phenomenal job. Yeah, absolutely. I have to shout out to our composer Hannah. Uh, she used FMOD uh, to do a lot of the making sure everything was synced and running smoothly and stuff. Uh, she also composed every like a piece of music in the game. It's and not easy that's, feat. It's a lot of stuff too, for a short amount of time. Uh, it's just really, really cool, really appreciative. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. And back to you, Ben. <laughs> All right, thanks, Steve. Um, so our next award is in the visual art category. Um, so the art style of the game um, can vary in such an enormous way. One of the exciting things to me, um, as you know, someone who is also a visual artist, uh, is seeing the diversity of different visual styles that games can now encompass. Um, everything from the drive towards uh, ever greater levels of photorealism um, to like the raw and glitchy and sketchy and punk rock kinds of aesthetics, um, the incorporation of visual styles from all other kinds of art genres and all other kinds of media. Um, that this kind of experimentation and this kind of way of finding an individual artistic voice uh, through, uh, you know, through the game uh, is something that you have the freedom to do um, as, a, um, as a game maker. To introduce the, uh, and give out the award for excellence in visual art, um, I'm gonna bring back up Andy Wilcoxon. Hello again. Um, I have been extremely excited to hand out this award. Um, I I really personally feel, as I'm sure so do all of you, that video games are one of the most, can be one of the most profound mediums of expressing story and, and as, a, as a work of visual art. In this award, uh, in thinking of this category, I try to think of visual art not only in excellence in its standalone quality, um, but in its ability to work cohesively with the every other element of the game that it is a part of to add to the quality of the entire piece. Um, so let's meet the nominees for excellence in visual art. Excellence in visual art. Our song, Brendan Rufo, Misha Pozniakov, Sean Dowd, Emmett Mayer, Ariana Pargin, Nate Nelson, Alex Insky, Junji Wan. Savior of Dreams, Christopher Pugliese, Hannah Bilger, Hoon Suk Beneni, Rebecca Braniak, James Piesco, Skip King, Brianna Geck. The Inn at the End of the World. Sean Dunnigan, Sun Jung, Jimmy Jin, Brian Miao, Annabelle Prodnuck, 
Lucy Smithers, Miles Tyson, Sean Walsh. All right, folks, thank you so much for being here today. I, it was such an honor and such a privilege to be able to really sit down and play with your games. Um, I, I really feel that the stylization and the work that went into the art of each of these pieces is, is really just fantastic. And it contributes to a, the overall quality of each piece in a huge way. Um, so thank you so much for your hard work. And with that being said, I'm so excited to announce that the winner of excellence in visual art is the Inn at the End of the World. <laughs> thank you again. <laughs> um, the, the artists on the team, uh, Sean Walsh, Miles Tyson and myself worked really hard to create a cohesive and atmospheric look for an atmospheric game. It certainly paid off. I mean, I found myself, you know, really looking forward to seeing who would be at my door the next day because all of your character designs are extremely distinct from one another. I felt I could get an idea of who each who each of these little NPCs were before I even spoke to them. And the environment art is exceptionally appealing as well. Really excellent work. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Back to you, Ben. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. <laughs> No, there are um, some, yeah, some really, really unique visual styles um, in the uh, in in those games, um, and I think that's what's always, what really is always exciting about um, you know about seeing these works is uh, the the number of different ways um, that you can take them um, and the different kinds of uh, the different kinds of imaginations uh, that you can bring in and the different kinds of visual worlds that you can create. Um, but underneath all of that, games are still a technical feat. They're still a technical accomplishment. Um, you know, a digital game is, uh, you know, it might be a work of visual art, it might be a multimedia uh, visual and sonic experience, um, but it's also software, it's also code, um, it's also bugs and battling all those bugs and then finding more bugs. Bugs, um, <clears throat> and in the end of the day, triumphing over um, over those bugs. Um, but in another way, uh, the kind of technical work in games um, is the code, but it's also the technical systems. Um, so uh, whether that has to do with the um, with the low level programming languages that are used to build the game engine, the gameplay code, or the design of the systems. Uh, that create the emergent behaviors um, and the gameplay structures that we can experience as players. The technical intricacy of games is what makes it all happen. Um, so I'm going to bring Michael back up to uh, give out the award for technical excellence. All right. So the finalists for the Technical Excellence Award all display great technical expertise, whether it be through their ability to engineer a seamless experience for the player or through the design of complex gameplay systems with a level of polish that goes above and beyond. For the Technical Excellence Award, we were looking for entries that were not just games, but collections of solidly designed and engineered systems that show the potential to be expandable past the scope of this competition into a project that delivers a great user experience consistently. Here are the finalists for technical excellence. Technical excellence. Stalagmike, Andrew Sirkok, Habiki Takaku, Xavier Marshall, Greg Sirkok, Tatum Hobby, Julia Krajic. States of Siege, the Northern Expedition, Yi Yin Chen. So Norse Expedition is a war that happened in China from 1926 to 1928. This war ended the war of era in China nominally and spread it. Voyage, Jingyu Zhuang. Hey. So great job to all the finalists. Um, there's only much, so much we can do as judges without seeing all the hard work that went into creating the complex systems of these games, whether it's staying up until 3 AM trying to finish a feature or diving deep into the complex rule set of a strategic board game. Uh, but everyone in this category wowed the judges with their technical prowess. So great job to everyone. <laughs>
<laughs> um, the winner of the Technical Excellence Award surprised the judges with a smooth experience from start to finish. Uh, the finalist, this finalist had a great core mechanic, clean UI, an unmatched level of attention to detail, and a collection of game systems that combined to create a truly fun and memorable adventure. The winner of the Technical Excellence Award is Stalagmic. Wow. <laughs> I'm Congratulations. so honored to receive this award. Uh, I want to give a huge shout out to Xavier, who really worked uh, hard to get uh, uh, especially the mic detection system to work. Uh, we had a lot of challenges trying to uh, get that to function, and we nearly had to give up. But I think, yeah, but through trial and error, we were able to get that going. Yeah, that it was yeah. a great core mechanic, and it, it just worked. It seemed like it just always worked flawlessly, you know, and, and with the UI and with just the attention to detail past that too, past that one mechanic. It's just like the ring that appeared around you that lit up the same exact color, and it appeared on the walls if you were too close to a wall, and and uh, the shader that makes you visible through a wall if something's in front of you. It was just like for co competition entry, it was just insanely polished. <laughs> so. Uh, what was the biggest engineering challenge? What did you say? It was the sound? The yeah, definitely mechanic? for the initial uh, mic detection system. Uh, it was very laggy at the beginning. And uh, Xavier worked through some multi-threading in order to uh, get the game to run more smoothly. And mm -hmm. also on top of uh, having to think of mechanics that would uh, work with the mic detection, it took some trial and errors to figure out the design for that. So that was mainly the huge challenge, but I'm glad it really paid off. Yeah, great job. Thank you very much. And now we're moving on to the next award. Thanks, Michael. The games take us out of our everyday lives and they bring us into, um, into game worlds, fantastical worlds, fictional worlds. They let us be somebody else for a little, um, for a little while. Um, they let us be someplace else. Uh, but games can also have an impact in the real world. So they can open our eyes to other ways of seeing the world. Uh, they can tell the stories, um, uh, points of view that may not, we not, may not uh, know ourselves. Um, and they may change us. They may motivate change uh, in the world as well. In short, they may have an impact. Um, and that may um, range from global issues, uh, around social issues, around, uh, around climate, um, around, uh, uh, around global issues um, to, you know, to the direct, to the personal, um, to the local. So here to introduce the Impact Award again, uh, it's Andy, come on up. Hi, again, um, I'm very excited to be presenting this award um, because I believe that the the social and emotional impact that we put into the art and the games that we make is is unimaginably important. Um, I personally see game development still very much as a wild west of a storytelling medium, um, not just in the artwork and the stories that we tell, but in the gravity of those stories, in the vulnerability of these, of the human condition and how putting that out there can be so very difficult and yet so still very meaningful. Here are the finalists for this year's Impact Award. Impact Award. Cursed B. Abigail Every Pollard. Every begins with a single step. So let me get this straight. You grow flowers from your skin that make things happen, and you have no idea how or why. Grocery Run. Zaire Wilson. Stop it. Stop it right now. Voyage, Jingyu Zhuang. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your hard work. Um, when it comes to telling very personal, emotional, vulnerable human stories, I think it takes a lot of thought a lot of effort and a ton of personal strength. Um, so really hats off to all of you because this was this was a really, really tough category to think about and get right. Um, with that being said, um, uh, 
I'm super excited to announce that the Impact Award goes to Grocery Bun. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. That's surprising. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I just like to shout out the the two people um, who helped me in development. There's an artist uh, that goes by uh, Knox, um, and she helped me a lot with the character art. Um, and my girlfriend, actually, Caitlin, uh, <laughs> she voiced uh, all of the, the the Karens in the game. All um, the I'd Karens. Like, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I'd also like to thank all of my professors because this is a part of my the the thesis project and um, the critical game design program that I'm in. And they they helped me um, a ton in terms of directing a lot of uh, my ideas and, and to what Grocery Run is now. But yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, of course. Engaging with Grocery Run was was really awesome, and and I think that there was enough of that tongue in cheek, that humor, yeah. that stylism that I yeah. thought really really sold the message in in a very prolific way. So, thank you so much. Excellent work. It. All right. Let's move on to our last category. All right, thank you, Andy. So the last um, last category the judges looked at um, is the overall grand prize. Uh, so we've seen how games are made with all these different elements brought together. The grand prize is looking at the games um, where the whole is more um, uh, than the sum of its parts. Um, how uh, how all the elements kind of blend together uh, and make something uh, make something really extraordinary and really memorable. Um, and so Steve is going to come up and help me give out the award for the grand prize. The grand prize. Yeah, I, I think one of the amazing things is this year there were so many games that had you know parts that were just really amazing like oh there was this game that was uh, that did this part and that was that was fun and oh i wish we could give that one an award but there's just too many games to give everybody an award and spread that money out to have uh, be effective but there is one that uh, kind of fit as many of the categories or um, more of the categories together and i think that's the uh, one of the things is that there's a high level of creativity uh, RPI is consistently uh, a school that uh, brings brings it when it comes to creativity. And the grand prize for the game that brings all elements together, creative and the original ideas, well-designed, implemented gameplay, and strong aesthetics. Uh, once again, there were some games, there's some of these games that just from, a, from an aesthetics point of view were just amazing. And some that were from a technical point of view were just, you know, I... Uh, I wish I was on some of these teams because it would have been a lot of fun working with them. Uh, if you take out the hours having to put into it, because I'm not <laughs> I'm not into that anymore. But uh, let's take a look at some of the, the, this year's finalists. Grand prize. The Inn at the End of the World. Sean Dunnigan, Sun Jung, Jimmy Jin, Brian Miao, Annabelle Prodnuck, Lucy Smithers, Miles Tyson, Sean Walsh. Savior of Dreams, Christopher Pugliese, Hannah Bilger, Hoon Suk Beneni, Rebecca Broniak, James Piesco, Skip King, Brianna Geck. Zhuang. Hey, congratulations, finalists. This is a, it was a pretty challenging category this year because there were so many games that were just really, really good. And uh, trying to find one that maybe eked out that 
0.5 higher or 0.5 less, you know, to see which one would be win. Uh, the winner was was tough for us. Uh, we each kind of had our favorite. I think one thing that I kind of look at when you're, you're looking at developing or you're at a studio head level at the, you know, the uh, executive level is that you look at, if I was to give this team $100,000 to polish this and really make it uh, a final a final game, how would this do? So that that's not something we, we necessarily think about very often is, you know, we just think about, hey, is this fun and, and what can I do with this? But you also need to take a look at, you know, given some time and uh, a little more effort and some, some actual money, what could this become? And could it become something that uh, is, it could, could be a big change? And so that's what we looked at for, in addition to culmination of all the uh, categories together. Uh, but this year's winner for the uh, grand prize is Voyage. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to um, receive this award. Yeah, I think it was really cool. I think it's it becomes even more personal because right now we're living in upstate New I'm originally from Salt Lake City, Utah, and I could go to Utah. And, you know, I think Ian Andy was talking about being able to go to downtown Troy and plant a flower. Like, you know, I've been there. This is me. And I've, 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 uh, I've been at this spot. And you could do that you know, in the Forbidden City in China, it's uh, it's it's an amazing uh, platform that could give it some give it some extra money, some uh, ten thousand artists and art designers and all these people working on it. This could be you know really amazing. Congratulations! Yeah. Thank you, thank you. And um, I'm really thrilled to have like more people coming to me say like, hey, um, I really had a good time coming into th this world. And that, that was really inspiring and what keeps me to um, work on this project. And I'm glad it finally plays off. Thank you. You're welcome. And back to you, Ben. All right. Thanks, Steve. And congratulations to Jingyu and to all of the, uh, uh, all of the winners and all the nominees. Um, and again, really, to all of you um, for uh, for the work that you've done, um, I'd like to bring all the judges back up for a little bit, for uh, you know, for a little bit of a uh, chat before we um, before we finish up here uh, tonight. So, um, so Steve, you you've uh, been involved in Game Fest a number of times um, over the year. What stood out for you this year compared to other years uh, in the games that you looked at? Well, I think there are years where sometimes, I mean, actually, in the past years, you've had other schools competing against you. So you've had RPI versus RIT, and and or maybe not RIT, Champlain and um, uh, Marist, and other schools coming together. So this, unfortunately, is just RPI. But the great thing I've noticed this year is this is a lot of creativity. There's some uh, games that didn't get actually that didn't win anything, but that were amazing. Like uh, you just put in the chat there, uh, Froggy to the Moon. Froggy <laughs> that, was a, that was such a funny. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I loved that one. It was a funny <laughs> game, right? I, yeah. I can't imagine being the guy singing that too. Congratulations, whoever did, whoever sang that, Froggy to the Moon. It was <laughs> pretty well done, but that was great. And you want to talk about the other one that you're mentioning there, uh, Andy? Yeah. Um, well, for I could do the moon, it just, I kept being surprised by, you know, how I could use the mechanics in different and fun ways. That was always cool. But one thing that, that we kept coming up in our conversations over and over again was troubled seas. Um, and it was so, it was so difficult, unfortunately, to find, you know, a spot for it. But like, we talked about it over and over how the, I, I personally was super drawn to the, the way that the levels are lit, the design, um, you know, other games that it reminded me of that were super fun and that I hadn't considered, you know, with any pirate elements before. It was just really, it was cool. It was a good time. I really enjoyed the intro. The intro was, you know, yeah. like, dun, 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 like, oh my gosh, there's this, you know, pirate ship. And yes. And it's, uh, it was oh. really drawing you into it. And then you, get into the game and you're like, oh crap, <laughs> I plugged faster, in my, faster, faster. I plugged in my Xbox controller that like intro comes up and it's like, oh, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready for whatever's coming. <laughs> Bring it, man. Bring it. <laughs> Michael, was there uh, um, any games that 
Oh, stood out, stood out for you that didn't get um, that didn't get mentioned in the in the awards so far. Uh, so, sorry, I don't have the list in front of me, but um, yeah, Froggy to the Moon. I had a lot of fun with that mechanic. Um, oh. What was it? Was it was it called Twilight Forest? What was it? Voyage. Oh, uh, Violet Dawn. Oh, Violet, Violet Dawn. Dawn. Yeah, yeah. Not Voyage. Sorry, I'm sorry, Violet Dawn is what I meant to say. Me. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was pretty beautiful. Um, that yeah, that was really. Um, but yeah, I don't know. They were all really good. Yeah, I liked uh, I liked the that environment in that was really great with the, especially with all the stars and stuff like that. But I'll um, I'm we did mention it already. Andy talked about it, but the um, in at the end of the world, uh, the art style, especially I'm a I come from a art background as well. I was a texture artist for a number of years and an artist and at VV, uh, but with the fine art background and the painterly kind of style that was in that uh, in at the end of the world. It was really appealing to me. I think it would be great to see even more like, hey, we just bought another inn that's not quite at the end of the world, but here's this other inn and we're going to do another, you know, another art style or not another art style, another environment. It was just, uh, yeah, it was appealing to me. I agree. I, the inn at the end of the world and voyage, they're in, in technical elements and in art style. Um, we're definitely appealing in that they, I think they called out to a sense of loneliness that, that kind of melancholy, a game that makes you feel very seen, um, but not necessarily sad. And like there were mornings at the end where I wouldn't have anybody show up and I would just be so bummed out by that. Like it just, it really reinforced the oppressiveness of the the empty world. And the and, music too. Yeah, the music too. And, and that emptiness in Voyage too, like putting a flower outside of my apartment <laughs> felt like calling out, you know, even though I knew there was nobody there. And I think there's value in that. A lot of value, for sure. It, um, sorry, I, I I scrolled through the Discord to see some of the other games I was forgetting about. Uh, Dear Diary, I enjoyed a lot too. That was really close with the narrative and with the art. Was it did really great with both of those. Um, yeah, that was one of my favorites. Oh, I think I want to mention something about States of Siege because uh, there are people at our studio that play a lot of these really intense board games that take hours and hours just to describe the, the how to how to play the game and uh i could see a lot of our you know hardcore geeky board gamers just really getting into the system design and the on the setup on this and that was that, that was a lot of work i don't know if i would have the patience to play a game like this through the whole time i'm more of a, a let's play risk that's a three or four hour game but this seemed like it might be more like a eight or nine hour game pretty intense yeah the level of knowledge that that the creator of states of siege has is really quite remarkable and i honestly saw it you know like saw that kind of design as a future in educational tools um having that love of history is i think there's definitely a place in games for that yeah Something I was I wanted to ask you all about is well this really should have been a question at the beginning of the semester or the beginning of the year like not now at the end um, but advice about remote work uh, because you know, like you like like many other game studios around the world right have been you know, been working remotely during this year um, and the students have been you know working through this experience of how to work in remote teams and how to work with a team that's you know part. Uh, in upstate New York and part in China um, and dealing with time zones and dealing with internet connectivity and all these different issues. Um, right now, um, also you know, just that's like another, another shout out to all the students for everything that you've um, worked through and overcome. Like, like right now there's um, uh, some kind, you know, there's, there's a large, a, a substantial internet outage um, on the RPI campus. Um, and so some students have had to find other places to go to be able to get online to even be here um, in this uh, in this online uh, experience that we're doing here today. Um, so like that kind of inventing, you know, like new ways, new workflows, resilience, um, uh, <laughs> figuring out a new way to do it when the other way crashes and burns technically, you know, like what have you learned from from this? What are the what are the pro tips <laughs> that, that you figured out? Um, so the backbone is obviously like good tools, like, you know, like you have like task management, 
like there's like free stuff like Trello, which is great, and the communication like Discord and stuff. I'm assuming for like a more casual team, and really, I feel like asynchronous communication is kind of like a learned thing. Like for me, at least, it was um, when I started like remote work on like a MOBA like uh before like a year before covid so i kind of got that year to like get used to it before everyone went remote <laughs> at the same time so uh, that was nice but yeah i don't know it uh just learning like how to communicate with people in a way that you know that like like prioritizing things in a way that you can do work that other people don't need to get back to you for and just like figuring out how to do that i don't know i feel like it's kind of a learned skill a little bit I would say don't wait six months to get a decent chair. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like, obviously like, yeah, that's a joke, but it's also not a joke. I sat in that piece of garbage dining room chair forever when we first started going home. Cause I kept thinking we're going to go back. We're going to go back to the studio yeah. any minute now. It's going to be over any second. Just get a really good chair. Um, but you know, more substantially, I would say the, the cinematics animation team room, uh, it, at the studio, maybe maybe only as a second to the first floor VFX room. Uh, our, I would say our team room was like one of the rowdiest, just always some tomfoolery going on in that room. We always had a great time together. The team meshes so amazingly well. Um, we get along great and we support each other. And when we went to working from home, we really lost that, That's that connection and that feeling of being in, in that collaborative environment. So really leaning into m any kind of multiplayer game, any kind of, whether it's like an environment or any kind of space, like like the animators have all been playing Valheim, like it's our job. <laughs> we just beat the third boss, moving on to the Tundra. But, you know, we would have Call of Duty tournaments. We would have, you know, we would play soli solitaire, anything like, just having any kind of connection is is so valuable. I can't state how valuable enough it is, especially when you're feeling that sense of loss. That's a tough thing to go through. Yeah, I think get one a of good the things, chair. Oh, yeah, definitely get a good chair. <laughs> Uh, I think one of the interesting things is that the beginning, uh, when we thought this was maybe three or four, you know, actually I thought it was going to be like two weeks. So <laughs> I think we all did. After, after four weeks, I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I'm going to go nuts because uh, I'm a I'm a I'm a people person. Darn it! I really enjoy connecting with people, and I think one of the things that we've noticed is there are certain people at the beginning, and they're like, yes, I get so much done working from home because I'm not bugged, and I can just really focus on my work. But then what we're seeing now, and I've, I've been interviewing a lot of people at the Irvine campus where, you know, the, on the Blizzard side, they're the D4 team, the D2 team that are over on the California side. And it's, there's so much culture that you have when you're at the studio. Like Andy, you were saying, you know, being in the, in the team room with the cinematic people and there, yeah, there's a lot of fun and things that happen. And there's conversations you have in the hall and there's, you know, you can do things uh, playing pool or uh, ping pong table or just, you know, the tournaments thing. We, there's a lot of camaraderie that happens or even just side conversations like uh, I can look over the room and I can see Andy working on whatever this thing's and she's watching, you know, you know, video as well. And I'm like, ah, oh, that's a so funny one. I've seen that. Meme. You know, you can and you can talk a lot, but you don't have that when you're virtually right and you're working virtually. Um, and it's, you lose a lot of that camaraderie, that kind of uh, glue that makes the team gel well. And so after this much time, we see people, even that were hardcore programmers, no offense, Michael, that really just like to be on their own and just code are at the point where they're like, you know, I, I don't think I wanna just work from home anymore. I wanna at least do a hybrid because I wanna see people and talk to people and, and I'm missing a lot of that. So it's uh, a lot of what keeps you at a company for so many years, like myself, is the people. It's less about the actual game you're working on because games come and go. Yeah. I I went from working remote to getting a new job during the pandemic. So I've never actually seen the office. <laughs> <laughs>
you'll have to come back when you're full time. Yeah. I mean, there's so many little, little things. Like we have this coffee maker that is cursed. Um, it broke. So the cafe, you know, one. Yes. <laughs> that one we would get routinely get a maintenance email like it broke again guys sorry and like a month into working from home i was like i miss the coffee machine breaking i <laughs> i miss i miss putting up my stupid mug in and like trying to get a cappuccino and it just spits out like grounds <laughs> which has totally happened to me before just like yeah definitely and I saw a message, aren't those like just sitting there still like being paid for? Like every Oh yeah, time? yeah, I do have invoices oh we're paying for them. That and the Coke <laughs> machine, the Coke and Pepsi machine downstairs, those oh my different God. flavors that you can do. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, where you can like the beer on tap is is turned off though. <sighs> yeah, that's the one thing. The animators always had beer Fridays when we would go to the taps in the cafeteria and just chill. Um and you know, because of that for our game jam, we we started talking about wouldn't it be funny if there was a zombie mode in Tony in Tony Hawk? That'd be funny, right? And so for our game jam, we were having all having a beer together, and we just decided to make it. You know, missing out on that that team nature, that sense of camaraderie is is a really big deal. And I actually, you know, one thing that has really helped is that a lot of our leads um, and supervisors have. Um, actually set up meeting blocks that you have to attend, right? Like it's a meeting in your Outlook calendar that's just for social hour. It's just for talking about what movies you've been watching or books you're reading or, you know, whatever nonsense. I mean, getting as much of that as possible is is hugely important. Uh, yeah, thank you. Cursed coffee maker. So, so that's what you've got to look for, look got to look forward to and go back to the office. Is it? Miss it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm really selling the idea here. But <laughs> that sounds fan yeah, that sounds fantastic. I'm, I'm gonna want to see this the next time I can come over and, and get a tour. Yeah. Um, all right, I want to give one more question to um, to all of you, which is what 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 are you looking at on the horizon? What are you looking forward to? Maybe like in games, but also just in general um, in this coming year as we as we look towards the future. I'm looking forward to, and there are things we're looking forward to. Is actually, eventually, this is going to finish, right? We're going to everybody's going to be mostly vaccinated. I just got my second vaccination yesterday. I thought I was going to be dead today, but I did, I'm doing okay. Uh, but you know, we're looking eventually to get back into full time. Everybody is at school, or and everybody's at the office, or at least um, um, hopefully most everybody's at the office. And what that new norm is going to look like, you know, because it won't be the norm we're used to back in the, you know, the, uh, in the before days, you know, when people would go outside with that, that day ball, you know, with, or see things in the, um, but going back and, and seeing <laughs> real people and talking with people, I think it's going to be so refreshing and exciting that uh, I think maybe the first week or so it's going to be hard to even work because you're like, you know, excited and, and hey, we're back here and I, the, my, my plants are all dead, but my desk is there. I remember my desk. My plants. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I used to have plants. They're all oh, dead. No. I, left I thought it was going to be two weeks, right? Right. Yeah, I think, you know, games and uh, the way we work and the way we interact are totally changing now. You know, I think games have had a big impact on people as they've been sitting at home and now I'm playing with their friends and it's maybe like what Andy was saying, it's one of the ways to socialize with people. And um, it's going to impact the way we look at games going forward as well. I agree. And and also it's just narratively playing playing games about stories about this time. I feel like we're, you know, in the next 10, 15 years, I think we are going to see a lot of playable interactive narrative experiences about about this part of our history. And that is going to be, I think, uniquely cool and sad. <laughs> well, games like The Last of Us, when you're playing The Last of Us and you hear, you know, there's a worldwide 
disease that causes people to do that. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, all right. Like, oh, there's going to be Whatever. a worldwide disease. Yeah, right. <laughs> but you know what? The zombie apocalypse is going to happen. You should get you should get your stuff together and get your uh, your supplies get your toilet ready. Paper. It's going to happen. <laughs> And it's going to happen in Tony Hawk. It's going to be Tony Hawk zombie. Apocalypse. That's what I'm hearing. There you go. It's yep. going to so. infect everything. It's going to that's, be nanobots take over. Yeah. Skateboard zombies. That's right. Um, all right. Well, uh, thank you all so much. We have one more award um, to give out, and this is the Audience Choice Award. Um, so this is the award um, that... All of you watching um, and checking out the games and participating in Sansar and um, playing all these things, this is the one that you have all voted for um, as as the choice for the audience. And this year's Audience Choice Award goes to the Inn at the End of the World. <laughs> Stall for... Oh, God. <laughs> um, which I did. Uh, speaking on behalf of the audience, this was a really difficult choice. We all collectively found this to be a really hard thing. There were so many great contenders, um, but we all, as as the audience, felt that this was the um, this was the game that deserved to win the award this year. So congratulations, <laughs> welcome back. So much. Um, great job. Yeah, I, this game just started off as like a feeling or like a, a desire for human connection in these past couple of years. And it's so gratifying to see the game, the capital G game that it's become I'm really proud of what we've created. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations. All right. Well, so that concludes the awards portion of our show um, and wraps up Game Fest 2021. Um, so congratulations again to all the winners, uh, all the finalists, and all the students for all the work that you've done. Uh, thank you to the judges uh, for all of the work that you did in, uh, in reviewing and playing and thinking about these games and all the feedback that, um, that you gave. Um, let's see, a couple, of, a couple of notes. So next year, now I said this last year, I went back and I looked at the video from last year and it was so fun. It was so cute. I was like, oh, yeah, so next year we'll be back in person. And here I am again um, doing this online and saying again that next year Game Fest will be back in person. Um, and we're going to expand it um, back up to being uh, – we plan to expand this back up to being a larger regional event and getting more schools back in here and uh, making a fantastic show. So that's something that I'm looking forward to uh, for um, next year with seeing all of you uh, in, in, in person as well. Um, let's see, a couple other things going on this evening. If you're looking for uh, some more uh, some more fun things to do after we wrap up here, uh, tonight is the, uh, is the RPI Spring Concert, uh, which, is, uh, which is also online. Um, and if you've been um, if you've been hanging out with us in Sansar and want to go and party, I want to recommend the Elro Show um, at the Tobacco Dock Virtual um, Ray with Desperados going on right now already. It started um, over in Sansar, so if you just go to events.sansar.com, uh, it's the you know, it's the top thing right there. Uh, so that's a massive uh, virtual electronic dance party going on uh, in Sansar. So hopefully we'll see some of you uh, over there. All right. Thank you all. You've been a wonderful audience. Um, I'm glad you could spend uh, spend uh, some, of your, uh, some of your Saturday here with us um, and join all this great work in game design. And with that, thank you. Um, see you next time. <laughs>